Well, greetings. I'm going to call the uh, meeting of the Finance Committee of December 7, 2021 to order. And it's exactly two o'clock, so we're right on time. And uh, see if I can get the um, agenda um, available to us and uh, that'll help us to start the meeting. So do you have the agenda or shall I? I'm it? getting it right now. Okay, um, so I think that everyone is here and uh, we're, the um, reason I hardly need it is just to crib off the notes of what I need to be reminding people of regarding the meeting, but I'm gonna go ahead right now and uh, take attendance of the committee and make sure that um, everyone uh, can uh, hear me and be heard. And uh, so let's start with Bob Hegner. I'm here. And Bernie Kubiak. Here. And uh, Lynn Griesmer. Present. Kathy Shane. Here. Pat D'Angelis. Here. And Dorothy Pam. Dorothy, you're here? Here, yeah, it's hard to unmute. And uh, Matt Holloway? Here, present. Okay, so we have everybody here in pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021. This meeting will be conducted by a remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. Um, no in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the meeting in real time by technological issues. Um, I uh, noticed we have some additional people in the room. Um, and uh, there's a... Yeah, Andy, I invited some additional um guests uh, for the reorganization plan. They're um, representatives from the implementation team that will help with some of the questions that were asked. Okay. Um, uh, before we, uh, just so I know, is everybody for that discussion currently in the room? Uh, there was a request to not start that conversation before 2.30 um, because there's one member who um, I think is hoping to join, but can't join before 2.30. Uh, actually, there's a, there's two members. There's one staff member and then a member of the implementation team um, who can't be here till 2.30. Okay. So um, what I'll do is when we get to that agenda item, I will have you introduce the um, additional people who are present, but we sure. will hold it off for now, if that's okay. Yep, that sounds good. And um, so we're going, we're still looking at the agenda that's on here. And um, so I want to um, go through the um, agenda with everybody just to make sure that we understand what we're doing and kind of briefly overview it and then come back and actually turn into it. The budget guideline discussion got rather complicated last night because it was not, there were a lot of comments and a lot of suggestions made. And uh, uh, I did receive from um, Mandy a memo of her comments, but I have not had a chance to work with them. What I thought would be um, a useful thing for me to be able to do, but I was not able to do it for today's meeting is to go through the uh, current draft as it was submitted and um, listen to the meeting, that section of the meeting again, because the way that uh, Lynn, you read, managed the meeting was very helpful and that you did it in order of the actual document so that um, by listening, I can make sure that I capture all comments and not um, based upon notes that were hurriedly taken last night during the meeting and what one member sent to me. So, but I do think it's important that we have a discussion about the guidelines discussion from last night. 
and um, try and get our own sense of what the highlights were and what our reactions to it were and um, how we might want to fra frame responses um, on it. And I, so I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, the uh, financial policies and objectives, um, I would uh, propose to put further down on the agenda because it sounds like we want to try and get to the financial consequences of the two reorganization plans at 2.30. And I think that that's a high priority item I would propose for the committee to deal with. It has serious financial implications to it. And uh, we know that the um, deadline is coming up <laughs> just a couple of days for the uh, public forum. So we want to be able to um, frame the comments. So I, I think that the importance of those two items say that we should uh, move that up and uh, as um, much as we can. And uh, we'll talk about the work plan um, later in the meeting. I won't say much more about that. Um, so is that all right uh, with people, uh, with everybody on the committee, anybody who has questions about it or suggestions for a different approach, please just raise your hand. Okay, seeing none. Uh, we have two attendees, um, and I don't know if either one of them has any public comment that they wish to offer. And if they do, I ask that they raise their hand. Seeing that uh, there's um, neither of the current attendees is asked to be recognized, then um, let's talk about the guidelines. I think that um, it's very important that we actually take a couple of minutes as members of the committee to each of us go through and maybe state what we think were the major takeaways in whole that we heard last night. I've been thinking about this all day, so, and I imagine to some extent that you have too. So uh, that I, I thought that that would be more useful than going through the edit process, because the edit process, I'm, I'm not sure, wouldn't be better done um, by the method I talked about. So. Um, do you want me to start or does somebody else want to start and talk about what they said? Lynn? So one of the things that I heard was that people wanted some redundancy in terms of things that were stated. And I think that's a stylistic issue and something that we as a committee can make a decision about uh, because pulling all into the memo almost creates a new memo. That's one observation. There's others. Okay, Kathy. I think Bob had his hand up first. But that's all right. Go ahead and then I'll call him Bob. Um, Lynn, I, I heard that a little bit, but I also thought um, there's an artful way to do it, like the first time we mention something, mention it with a full definition and or throw it into a footnote, you know, on the page um, so that you don't do a large thing. So even one of them was uh, use the words in one section and say, we discuss this more later, you know, so that it's that we don't, we try to minimize the repetition. But it's, you're right, it, it's a style issue. You're gonna to get to it later, but I'm gonna tell you, you're gonna to get to it later, <laughs> so. Um, anything else? Did you have any uh, takeaways of your own observations? And if not, I'm gonna call him Bob. Uh, well, j just the one other is that on tone, um, at least one person, but then another, wanted us to be stronger, you know, to get rid of start to do something and say, we will do something um, and uh, to be more explicit. So 
and I thought those were good suggestions. You know, if we're going to do this long a memo, we might as get provided a recommendation to the extent there's consensus about the recommendation. I'm I'm done. Okay, Bob. Yeah, I just want to echo that. Um, I agree that one of the comments that resonated with me was that the document should be more direct. You know, if we want something to happen, we should say it should happen rather than kind of being polite. Um, and then the second thing, which I think we don't, I don't think we can address it this year, but I think maybe next year we ought to think about it is to make this document shorter and more succinct. I think one of the comments I heard was it's very long, it's very involved. And I can see how, you know, the reader could be lost in, 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 in the document. And maybe if we could be more succinct um, and not, you know, maybe if we have to reference things, maybe reference them through footnotes or something. But um, I, I think it might be punchier if we can figure out how to make it more succinct. That's all. Yeah, no, I, th I heard that too. And uh, I guess uh, my comment on it was that. Uh, we tried to do all things to all, for all people in one document. And I think that we kind of got caught up in it because we also were trying to use it as a way of providing information about the whole budget process and financial status of the town for new members of the council who were taking office in January. And I think that uh, by making it one document as opposed to doing two different documents, um, we may have uh, gotten that confusion. Dorothy? Um, I'm not in total agreement with some of the uh, comments. Um, I think clarity is essential, and that is using uh, clear names and using the same names when you refer to things. Um, you might want to do something like, like four bullets at the top of the document that just sum up each section in one sentence. If somebody just wants to know, are we good? Is this okay? Is this okay? That'll be fine for them. But because we're supposed to be a transparent government, we can't really have exqu exquisitely finely honed documents that are really understandable by experts. So, I mean, I do appreciate what you were doing, Andy. You were trying to explain and give some context for the complex actions that are going on. So um, I did not have any criticisms on your length, but I think some people, I mean, given that we're just inundated with documents, might want like a little like an abstract you know academic articles often have an abstract this could just be a series of bullets um summing up each of the points each of the sections um to let people know more needed to be done here or whatever um but i i thought if you were communicating and um some of the suggestions were to do with uh, just simple noun naming which i agreed with um and sometimes that means a little repetition and, I, and truthfully i think the fewer the footnotes the better but if you have a chart, you can have an appendix. I see an appendix better than footnotes. I mean, people, academia is getting rid of footnotes um, pretty much, or just put them at a section at the end, notes, because I know a lot of people just don't want to go into that detail. But um, I mean, given the fact that we have a lot of new people coming on the council, if they want to try to read one of the finance uh, committee's documents, I think they'd rather read something along the order that you wrote, because it, it does give them some information. So that, that's my response really as an English teacher. Okay, well, no, that's helpful. Uh, Kathy did have earlier in the process suggestions about using bullets. And uh, we ended up moving the bullets into a different document that was went to the council at the same time, which was the committee report. Pat? Yeah, I agree with a lot of the comments about things possibly being shorter. Uh, and more direct. Uh, but for me, the biggest takeaways were the emphasis on developing, you know, really developing strategic partnerships and things like that. Um, so I'm less concerned because uh, I, with the with um, the structure of the document, and much more concerned about the content and substance of it. Okay. In my observation that I'm going to share and then go back to Lynn, 
it's a little bit on a different side. I was struck by the fact that um, we had a message in there about limitation of resources. And I think that the limitation of resources message didn't get through, um, which is in a way okay, but not okay. The way it was okay is that people were willing to put forth what they saw as the needs to be uh, that they would like to see in the budget, but they didn't. There was, it wasn't structured in a way that they recognized the choices had to be made by adding things. You you have to figure out how you're going to pay for them, and so there was a little bit of a loss of ability to focus on that question, and. Um, you know, there was a suggestion of a very large capital purchase, but no discussion of, well, if you do that large purchase, what large capital need are you not going to address? And um, I think that was what I found for me most difficult, because I think it was important that the council actually provide that guidance, that's what guidelines are for, but um, it needs to be um, framed in a, in a different way in order to do that. And it's not gonna happen in a rewrite of this uh, particular um, document because we're too far into the process already. Len, your hands up. Yeah. Um uh, along the lines of the idea of introducing something once or speaking about it and then referring later, I also think that to the extent we can use the same um, labels that are used in the town manager's goals, for example, climate action, um, for, for major capital investments, um, that, that then relates back to that other document. But my reason for now wanting to speak was there were two specific recommendations that I heard. One was to strengthen the paragraph about the ladder truck. Uh, and the other one at which I totally agree with, but also don't want to ignore the role of um, JCPC in making recommendations about financial investments. Um, the other one that I heard was the one that uh, Darcy sent to Andy to you and I in advance, and that was to double the amount of money for the uh, climate action uh, from a 100,000 to 200,000 in this year's budget. Both of those are much more directive than we tend to be in this memo. And so I think it, it's worth discussing if that's something we wanna do. And of course, that sort of gets back to what I was just saying when I was commenting, which is if we are more directive, we also need to be uh, providing help to uh, how the choice is being made and where the uh, resources are coming from to pay for that. Bernie? Uh, you know, I, I'm, in, I'm in agreement with a lot of what's been said um, so far. Uh, I did, there was some concern raised about the, uh, the goals that are set for the town manager versus the content of this document and how there might be some conflict, if not confusion, between the two. Um, and, and I do, uh, I did notice that, um, well, we tried to provide some examples and be somewhat directive. It's like the ladder truck. People did, then came back and said, well, if you're going to add that, add more, add more, add more. So um, uh, I, I also agree with Andy that uh, there wasn't uh, sufficient emphasis put on difficult choice, making difficult choices. I mean, there's always greater need than there is money. And that's what makes this, uh, this whole process so interesting and troublesome all at the same time. Um, I also think the document could probably be made shorter and um, focus more on, on uh, uh, taking a look again at the, uh, the town manager's goals and maybe focus in a bit more on that so that we're in sync with town manager's goals and, and we're giving some direction around that. 
Are we getting the goals sufficiently in advance of doing the guidelines in order to be able to do that? And uh, is that something we need to be thinking about as holistically as a council? Kathy? Um, you know, I, I think all these comments are in line with the goals, Andy, so I don't think we have to, um, for example, on the strategic partnership, the goal wording is now execute rather than investigate or explore. So if we can borrow those words here, um, and it's explicitly not just UMass, but also uh, Amherst College and Hampshire College. And in our document, I think it should be in the context of revenue. You know, said that um, it helps us pay for uh, the town services. So it felt to me, you know, climate action is a central goal that we've set. For Somehow I think I lost. I think Kathy's frozen. Yeah. Lynn, you want to. Um... Not a paragraph. So, oh, wait, Kathy's back. Yeah. Oh. Kathy, can you? Uh, oh, our, was uh, I? Was, we um, lost you. Oh, sorry. I didn't lose myself. I I could see everyone. I just said, okay, uh, tell me if this is repetitive. What, what I said is, I think the comments last night and some of these are aligning it with the goals. We were explicit in the goals this year about execute strategic uh, partnerships. So if we strengthen the language here and put it in the context that it's revenues from the town and we need the revenues to pay for services, um, climate action is a clear goal and we were weaker here. And I think it's just adding a sentence. We were weaker than we were last year. Um, but I, I do want to go back to I don't know whether there are maybe four bullets up at top, but in the context of limited resources, we have to make choices. Um, we need revenues, you know, augmenting revenues is important. Uh, you know, if we could come up with four or five, it's a reader's guide to the big messages in this long document so they don't get lost. Lynn? I just want to mention in relationship to do we have the goals, it's a much larger discussion. The next council needs to get more realistic about timing of different things. So for the next step, town manager evaluation goals, now we do fiscal guidelines. Thank you. Yeah, which is a uh, something we can suggest, but it really is a matter that gets back to the President and Vice President is our agenda setters because you you guys manage the process and we need to fit into the process. And part of it is the charter, but that's something that you would be considering. Uh, yeah, I, um, so I guess the question is, uh, is it really possible for us to do an edit today or do we need to come up with another process and look at our meeting schedule? I think that to, my sense is to try and do an edit today is not a good use of our collective time, but I'm willing to hear from others. Lynn? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think if you send the document to us again, maybe even the Word document, we could make some suggestions. But Andy, we've got the two reorganization plans and a transition memo, even either, although for the finance committee, a transition memo is a much different thing than the other committees um, because the council is not going to be able to vote, oh, we're not going to pass a budget next year um, as part of its decisions on what not to do. So I think we should move on if we're done with this conversation and take advantage of the fact that we have this growing group of guests. Uh, I agree. Uh, Kathy, you have something else? Yeah, you want I, to... I, I want to agree with Lynn and I took quite good notes last night 
Andy. So if you send us the Word document and we, and I mark it up and send it just back to you, you could, and then I know Bob, it sounds like Bob was taking notes. I can be pretty specific on where I thought what needed to be changed. And you got things directly from two people. So I think we could come together with a marked up copy that cre uh, could then be discussed if we have meeting time, but I wouldn't do it. I don't think we can do it here. Yeah. Um, it sort of fell into two classes of things because one was is there were some very specific requests and then there was some global requests like make it shorter, make it more succinct, don't, uh, you know, be willing to repeat, but uh, those kinds of things, which are more large writing kinds of questions. So it really fell into two different pieces. But uh, to conclude this, um, so the plan is I will send out to the entire committee document that as it was finally uh, in its final version in the word format version. I usually try and avoid doing that um, when I don't want edits, but this time we do want edits. And, uh, you know, use your markup provision uh, ability. It is going to be um, difficult for us to go through um, assembling all of the different pieces, but I think we'll try, we'll do the best we can. And I will have to take charge of that, I guess, because we need to, we can't do it other than um, you sending things to me and me sending things back to the entire committee, but uh, we are not creating, otherwise we'd have to do, a, do it through another open meeting, which we will may have to schedule. We'll talk about that in, at the end of the meeting as to whether we ought to be scheduling another meeting. So if it is okay with everybody else, then I wanna um, ask Sean to introduce everybody and to make a suggestion. I assume we wanna do the CREST program first. Sure, thanks Andy. Okay. Um, so I'll introduce everybody. And then I think what I was, if you're okay doing this, was I was gonna go through the questions that have been were sent ahead of time um, and just sort of let speak who wants, who wants to speak on each question. Um, is that okay? Yes. Okay. Um, so we have several members of the implementation team that are here with us or, or people have been supporting the implementation team. So um, we have Brianna Owen, who you all know and was on the community safety working group. Same with Russ Vernon Jones. Uh, Chief Nelson has been part of the implementation team along with Jennifer Moyston. And Mike Curtin has been supporting that effort as well. Um, and Jennifer, I think Alicia is planning to join as well from the, from the implementation team. Those, those are the two co-chairs of the community safety working group. Um, and then last person who will probably join in a few minutes is our HR director, Donna Ray Keneally. Um, to weigh in on some of the questions on staffing or on how, um, how different salaries were, were determined. So the first question we received was, has the town considered a contracted out model um, in addition to the development of an in-house model? So I guess I'll look to Jen to sort of um, maybe delegate who would be best to respond to these. Has the, has the implementation team, Jen, looked at a contracted out model or, or has it only been focused on sort of the in-house program? So we used, LEAP had suggested that we, or recommended that we use an in-house as opposed to out mo contracted out model, um, mainly for several reasons. The existing programs that have, uh, Several existing programs have stated that hiring responders as city employees improves retention and relationships within the city agencies. Um, the town employment is more stable and likely to retain good employees. Another reason was the team would include both oh, behavioral health and mediation responders. And there aren't, there aren't any local organizations that would be able to cover both of those. Um, things and then the town would also be able to control hiring 
which is allows the town to appropriately, appropriately value the diversity of responders. Um, it also creates a better relationship between the departments that exist already within the town, the police department, dispatch, public works, fire. Um, and then I would just say Russ, Brianna, Mike, or Chief Nelson, do you have anything to add to that? No. And Russ? Well, I would just say that the community safety working group felt very strongly that they wanted uh, the CRESS responders to be town employees uh, for many of the reasons that LEAP cited. Uh, and it was our understanding that that was what we recommended and what the town manager budgeted and the town council approved. Yeah. Okay, I will go on to the, do you want me to see if there's any follow-up questions from committee members, um, Andy, before I go on to the next question? Uh, or, or just keep going. Why don't we do this uh, for this and future ones? If questions arise in your mind as you're hearing the reports on each question, raise your hand and then Sean will know that you have a question. And I um, will give about 15 seconds to see if anyone raises their hand. And if not, just go ahead and go to the next one. Okay. But um, for future, use the raise hand function, please. And that'll help to uh, let everybody, let Sean know you have a question. Okay, that sounds good. Um, so the second question, oh, Bernie, we got lots of questions. Okay, Bernie. Yeah, well, no, I, I just, uh, I, am, I understand some of the rationale behind having the, um, having the, the community responders be direct, direct hires, but the Department of Revenue recommends when you do something like this that you look at make or buy. And so there should be some, I think, uh, attempt to, to look at, at um, buying the service rather than simply making it. The other thing that happens, and CAHOOTS gets to be the model for just about everybody in this stuff, is CAHOOTS is a private clinic. And you lose, um, or you don't have, rather, you need to gain those variety of, of clinical resources and connections that having a uh, a vendor operated program may be able to bring in. So you, you have, um, you have a, the opportunity to do respite, you have the opportunity to do detox, you have the opportunity to do uh, information referral. Um, those are all important components to making this, this thing work. And it just, uh, you know, it, 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 becomes, uh, it becomes important over time to see how this operates and how you have those, those clinical and social connections. Uh, made between the team and uh, uh, various providers in the area, M most of whom or all of whom will be tax exempt or not for, not for profit organizations. So, Bernie, the one thing I would say in response to that is um, I don't think there's necessarily a good buy example um, of an agency out there that's doing exactly what the implementation team is is focused on. I think mental health programming is part of it, but it you know, what I've read, it goes much, it goes beyond mental health programming. It's not just mental health programming. Um, and so I think that's part of why the, the buy might not be as much of a viable option here is that we're really creating a program that's sort of brand new. Um, there's not necessarily a model out there in the area that can come in and say, we've got this, here you go. Um, it's yeah. it, a lot of it's going to have to be developed here um, either way. Yeah. No, no doubt that whoever does this is going to have to develop it because this is not something that comes off the shelf. Right. And I'm using, in contrast, the Northampton report, which covered the same ground, but was much less prescriptive in, prescriptive in, in uh, uh, coming up with a solution to this. Uh, so Northampton is taking a more open-ended approach. In fact, uh, the Northampton report encourages uh, the, the, uh, the city to look to the various um, uh, organizations that operate in it and that it may have relationships with it. So I understand this is new and I understand that anybody would have to build this from scratch, but that, that still, it still leaves the option of, of you know, it, it still has the, the option of a, of, a, of a purchase is still out there. Now we're headed in this direction. This is something I'm, by the way, I'm, this is something I'm very supportive of. 
I just want to make sure that we've covered all the bases and that this thing really works. Great. Thank, thank you, Bernie. And, and the other thing I'll just add quickly is um, I think most of you have seen we do have a DPH grant for the, um, the mental health side of this program. Um, sort of the, the clinical portion of where referrals can be made. We have a DPH grant that we're working with a partner um, uh, from Springfield who will set up um, offices here and then referrals can be made to that, to that group. Um, and at some point we'll bring that group in to talk with you all, I, I imagine. Uh, Dorothy? Um, I'm assuming that if they're hired by uh, as the town, that means they'll be bound by the same policies that other town workers are um, and get the same benefits or, you know, however they're prorated or whatever. And um, I think that to, to my mind is, it, are you doing this because you get more control and perhaps better relationship of these new people with existing town workers? Is that part of the rationale? Um, I don't want to speak for the town manager, but I think um, that, again, that the recommendation from the CSWG was an in-house program. Um, and again, those, like, as you said, Dorothy, those employees will be the same as all the other employees in town in terms of benefits. So I think it does give you more control when it's an in-house program. You can make adjustments to the program more easily than if it was a, an agency that had their own policies and procedures. Lynn? Yeah, I, I'd like you to think about it's not an all or nothing. It might be that we hire a lot of the same types of people, but then we contract with maybe this, this group in Springfield that gives us a broader range of say mental health services that we can then we can hire in any one individual. Mm -hmm. So we would still have a lot of town employees, but we would have an agency that gives us breadth that we can't get in any one individual. Mm -hmm. Kathy? Uh, then I, I'm looking at the budget that had been presented to us. So I agree with what Lynn just said as a, an approach. So um, as this is evolving, would we have a fund that allowed for that kind of flexibility to be purchasing and referral, you know, so right now we're looking at a budget that's uh, line items for people, health insurance, pension, vehicles. Um, so you, for to do what Lynn just said, um, in any given year, you would have to have um, resources somewhere in the town that allowed, allowed for that kind of, um, I, I won't even use the word specialized purchases, because you could imagine over time you would know roughly what you would need and you would need, you had a referral agency and it was a, a, a steady flow with a partner, you know, rather than rather than uh, this year we contract here, that year. So you, you'd like to develop, you know, um, long-term relationships with entities that you would like to be in a long-term relationship for, for these wraparound services, extra services, mm -hmm. whether, um, so th it's a question of the, the um, financing of all of this, which is, yeah. one I didn't send my questions in because I forgot, but I'll ask them as we go along. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a, those are good comments. I think, again, the DPH grant is sort of um, bringing that initial presence of a mental health provider group that the town can work with. Um, and then the other piece to that is we still have significant funds in ARPA that are intended to build out a more robust mental health network in town. Um, we want to get this first group in uh, to see how you know, to transition them in. And then our next step would be to look at those funds and, and plan for the long term. Um, but those funds were intended to incentivize mental health providers to come in here and develop a sustainable model for how they would continue beyond the grant. Um, and so, so I do think we're, we're allocating those resources to the, the grants that we have um, to try to build out that network uh, just for the town in general, but also for the community responder um, program or for the CREST program. Um, to have as a referral uh, service. So right, I will go to the next question. So is the LEAP report available? So I think, I don't know, Jen, is it public, public yet? I, I know it's almost ready to be posted, I imagine. 
the, both leap reports there was one that was done specifically for the CSWG on policy on the police policies and then there was one that was the leap report for crest programming and both of those are found on the CSWG website at the bottom of the page under resources good um and i i read through the latest one and somebody from the implementation team can correct me if i'm wrong um, i believe it reinforces the number that was added to the budget um, or that we're proposing to add to the budget in terms of the staffing level. Um, I believe it recommends at least staffing four teams of two responders. Is that correct, Jen or, or anybody from the implementation team? <laughs> okay, I just, I read through the uh, executive summary and I thought I saw that. Uh, Russ? I, I'm not sure how we should should say that. I think, we used those numbers because they understood that was the current reality in Amherst. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that they were making an independent recommendation. Okay, so I'll let everybody else then. You can read the report and make your own um, your own judgment on on how to how to read that report. Thanks, Russ. I, I believe I sent the report to um, Athena as well, so that it could be added to a packet if needed, or forwarded to the finance committee members. All right, so the next question is, what is the proposed staffing pattern? How many uh, teams per shift? And is there any planned reduction for the police department budget um, for the year upcoming? Um, I'll start with the last one, and then the I'll turn to the implementation team for the first two. So in terms of the planned reductions for the police department budget, um, there's nothing planned at this time for the police department budget, um, or for any budget at, at, for that matter. We're still developing the budget proposal for next year. so. Um, but in terms of the proposed staffing pattern and the teams per shift um, for the CRESS program, um, does somebody from the implementation team want to weigh in on that? Russ? Uh, yeah, we're looking at having one team uh, on duty, um, probably 17 hours a day. Um, in other words, you know, two different teams, but uh, there will never be more than one team on duty. We're, we're aiming for 24 seven response. Although some of the wee hours of the night that will be on an on call basis rather than a uh, on site uh, basis. And is it correct Russ that the model you're looking at right now is a four on two off um, schedule? Yes. In terms of the days. Okay. Like similar to the police department um, or police officer schedule. Similar right? to the police. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Jen, did you want to add to that? No, I was just going to include that it was four days on, two days okay. off rotating. Okay. Um, and just the general staffing pattern is um, the proposal includes a director. Um, an administrative position, and then eight community responders at the present time. And then we will, because of the DPH grant that we um, we received, again, we'll have this mental health support, but we will also have a, um, a, a program implementation position that's specifically on helping implement this department um, and, and adhere to the requirements of the grant. And that'll be a temporary position, that, that second one. Kathy? Um, as, as you uh, think of the two people that are on in any given shift, if a call comes in where the response isn't by phone, you really want to go out and it looks like it's uncertain whether the responder could handle it by themselves because of an uncertainty of the, what the situation is. Is there a vision that you would in the first year or so be trying out um, one police person going out with one crest person, or would it be two teams of each going out? What, what's the thinking? Because when I'm looking at what some of the other programs have evolved over time, and it's not instant, it's, it's um, you know, judgment calls. In this case, it should be pulling one from each side um, because of, uh, the likelihood of needing it, but you don't necessarily know that right at the beginning. So what's the thinking of, um, 
you know, learning over time, uh, shared the shared resources across, and I don't know whether EMT would ever be part of this too. So I'm just thinking, you know, that, you know, the, the situation seems to need a com combination of skills. Why don't we start with Mike and then go to Russ um, for that one. Mike? Thank you. So there's a lot in that question. Um, what I think it's been decided on is all the calls will be originating out of the dispatch center. So there won't be a whole lot of calls that are go to the Crest group to start with. So that office in the Crest, they won't be picking up too many calls. They may be there for us to transfer a call to that's not an emergent call. Um, we're kind of going full circle here. We need to decide what type of calls Crest is ultimately going to be going to in the beginning. And that's something we've been working through. Leap had some recommendations, but that's going to come down from the town manager's office and the, the department head's office, what type of calls Crest will be going to. So originally any calls that Crest is going to are going to be of the um, nonviolent, no weapons involved, no history of violence, those type of things. So they'll be fairly the safest calls that we can determine in the communication center through our protocols. There's always a chance that we may send a Crest team to a call and they may have to call for some backup or call for a police officer when they get out there. We've discussed some code issues with the fire department and Crest showing up and there might be some um, code violations that the fire department needs to know about. So we'd have to send the police and the fire department over. So those are things that we're working through. But to start the way, that, at least I believe the program will work is the Crest team will be going to the, the safest possible calls that we can send them to and see if they can expand their role from there. I'm not sure if I got all your questions in there, but. Can I follow up with just one example? Um, that was, an, a, a, to me, it made sense answer. Um, thinking through, aside from some kinds of community issues that will come up, one in neighborhoods that may have loud parties at night working with students. We have one excellent community liaison police officer. Would there, these are not necessarily violent, but you need to be able to speak with an authority. Have we talked about potentially using Cress staffing for that? So it's, it's uh, it would usually be student behavior in a neighborhood, um, noise, uh, trash, uh, working with, uh, mediation or would that remain only a police function so noise complaints are something that have come up and the chief was uh, mentioning one of our last meetings that he's actually getting a lot of feedback that the police aren't going far enough in terms of arrests and citations and things like that and that's something crest wouldn't be doing um, the leap group included noise complaints in their study but that still hasn't been decided i and again i don't want to speak for the police chief but i believe that he's leaning at least to start that noise complaints would not be something that Crest went to originally, but it may be something that they would follow up with as our community liaison officer, Officer Laramie is doing now, he'll go out after the fact and talk to the, the party houses and try to get a little bit of um, curb behavior. So that may be something that Crest could play a role in moving forward, whether, and we still have, there's some things going on, a little bit of rub with what we refer to as a co-response, meaning Crest responding with police officers. So it might be something like follow-ups and noise complaints. Maybe we could get uh, a little bit more collaboration there with Officer Laramie going out with Crest members, kind of showing what he does when he talks to the students. Uh, maybe Crest will come up with some new, new ideas what they do when they talk to the students. Um, but right now, noise complaints, we're gonna, as far as I know, we're gonna remain with the police department to start. And also, it is, it's going to take Crest members away. If they're chasing around noise complaints on Thursday, Friday, Saturday night, if they're at a noise complaint and we get another call that's a mental health issue or a, a low priority, somebody needs to talk to somebody about a resource, if the Crest members are unavailable, we can either hold the call till they are available, or it might be the type of call we should send somebody over right away. So an officer goes to a call that Crest could probably handle better and vice versa. Russ? Thank you. Yeah, uh, we've talked about noise complaints and we are not yet in agreement on the implementation team about how they'll be handled. And some of that, I think, probably needs to wait until we get a Crest director hired and let the Crest director do some ride-alongs with the police department and get a better picture of, you know, what, what are the issues and what's it take to handle a, a noise complaint. So some of this we're going to develop as we go. Uh, 
But in response to your initial question, um, whether calls come in through 911 or whether they come in through a dedicated crest line that gets answered in Mike's communication center, um, we expect to have, have them responded to either by the CARES team, and it would always be the two team members would stay together, or by the, the APD. Uh, and with Mike's help, we're working on protocols that would sort out which calls are safe for CARES to handle and which would be uh, police. Thanks, Russ. Uh, Bernie? Um, yeah, just, I, I'm, I'm the, the memo that uh, that gone to the council makes reference to the police department. Um, I I'm glad to hear in terms of this conversation that we're we're bringing uh, Chief Nelson and Chief Nelson and literally, and uh, because this will have an impact on, on EMS as well, and that needs to be I, I think that needs to be noted. Um, one alternative, uh, which is being trialed in New York City, is to have a mental health worker. Uh, right along with um, a, a paramedic, uh, which is also basically what uh, what Cahoots does. And the um, if there's no, I don't know if there's any really good data on this, but one reference was made in terms of of Cahoots that um, the police department responds to, needs to respond to about 11 percent of the calls the Cahoots team um, initiates. So, so there will be some police involvement and that, that's gonna get figured out over time. I'm also happy to know that our, our communication center is managing this because with these incidents, you frequently get multiple, multiple reports and having it go to one source gives uh, uh, the communication center the opportunity to sort things out and make sure that uh, um, <clears throat> things, are being, things are being properly directed. Chief Nelson. Good afternoon. Uh, to Kathy's question, question, question about noise, 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 and place, all the all 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 speak 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 for, for the police, 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 police chief. One of the issues, and it's been a con con conflict within the group with the press response responding to noise complaints, is that it's going to take about five minutes or five se 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 seconds for the students students to re realize that press has no authority authority to do anything at all. That they they they. No, Crest does not have have, have the power, 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 power to find. They don't have the power, power, power to issue permit. Permit. They don't have the power, power to be authority to to to, to arrest. So, any Crest on uh, noise, noise complaints. We, I, uh, both both myself and and the, and the police chief feel that, that 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 that's not going to work. It, it's it's for me. It's a non non a non a non, a non -star, star starter and and not. A good use of resources because the kids are going to re re realize that anyone is going to re re realize. Well, you can't do. What can you do to me? Okay, fine. So then, so then, then, then you just you know you kind of kick kick the, that can down 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 the road. The other the other piece where we we're, we're still going back. Well, I you know it's just like going back 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 and forth. With that is the co is. The co 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 responder model going to what Bernie was just referring to. Our his 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 history and experience has shown that my department is going to be involved most 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 of the time in some way, shape, or form. And I think pairing a uh, mental health rule worker with it um, any either, either, either EMS provider with 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 the correct training 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 is the way to go I think in here here really we start out from a good 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 place there's a lot of a lot of trust from from the pub public with with in trust trust in, in the fire for fire for, 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 for personnel and we do this type type of work and have been doing this type type of work on an ad hoc baby, baby, baby basis for many years. So, I mean, from my my standpoint, I think the safe, safe, the the more efficient, effective, and safe, safe, safer way is that fire base, not 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 fire fire, fire base, but the code code co response water, uh, model where you use a, a mental health provider and um, any the EMS person. And that's you know, 
Um, I brought Brog brought it up from time to time, time to time, and I don't, and it, uh, it, it Bob, 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 Bob is me that we ha haven't looked at that in a, in a de 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 deeper manner. It seemed that model, model seems to work wherever, wherever you, you look, and it's worth a de 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 deeper look. So, Andy? Yeah, actually, I'm glad that uh, I follow immediately after Chief Nelson because he addressed some of the things that I've been thinking about. Um, one is about the students and noise complaint. I have the experience from having been on the select board uh, and being the select board representative to the campus and community coalition to really have observed how the response goes on noise complaints and attempts that we have made through our partnership with the university in the campus and community coalition to address um, noise complaints and the off campus student housing office has several programs that have really tried to address that issue um, one of the best known has a new name and I can't remember what it is currently, but it was Party Smart. And the idea was is that uh, students would be encouraged to register their parties in advance and give a cell phone number. If a noise complaint came in that uh, the uh, dispatch calls and uh, what the police call and say to the person who's hosting the party, uh, you have five minutes to break it up and we won't come to your house. And uh, there also have uh, what essentially are ambassador programs to work with uh, students also. So off-campus housing is doing so much. And if they can't be successful, then I'm not sure how we expect um, essentially uh, non-student uh, uh, Cress um, to be any more successful than what is essentially a student Cress program that's run by the off campus housing office. So I am really skeptical that uh, a noise complaint that doesn't get resolved at an early stage is going to be resolved without police response. The other thing about it is um, that I want to tie us back in the end to financial, which is why I'm going to make the next point. I do think that the co-responder model um, that uh, was discussed is something that is worth thinking about for quality of response. Um, and, uh, you know, I think about domestic violence and domestic violence can be very threatening and um, need police presence, it also can be that there's a victim that can be best served by somebody with the kind of expertise that we think that Crest is going to bring to the to the table with this. Um, but every time we talk about co-responder, we're actually adding cost. We're not subtracting cost. And in the end, what we're supposed to be doing is providing information um, and our thoughts back to the um process through the uh before the public forum and uh about what the financial implications of this proposal are and uh so anything that we're where we're seeing that the costs are going to increase in total uh, we at least have to say it up front because that is the financial consequence piece that we're being asked to look at jen Hi, so I, I have a couple of points and they're a little bit because everyone has spoken, then I have to add something else to it. So they're a little bit off topic. Well, not off topic, but perhaps not in the order as they originally started. Um, so one, I just want to say the noise complaints are very broad and topic and they're very and they range. Right. So while they might while the crest responders might not respond to the college parties, um, they could respond to other things because if we have two people who are having a mental health 
who are having a crisis in the middle of town, they're two individuals and they're suffering from mental health illness, they can respond to that perhaps, right? So we can't just quite close off noise complaints and only associate it with the college students. Um, originally, the, the CREST program is to help the BIPOC and other marginalized community members feel safer in Amherst. It's not necessarily to um, use with specific only to the college students. Um, Another part of all of this is training. Everybody has to be trained. The dispatch will have to be trained on how to understand the right calls to direct where, what questions to ask, if it's able, if they're able to ask additional questions. Um, the crest responders will have to be trained to de-escalate. They have to be trained to know when there is a crime. They'll have to know when there is too much violence. I mean, there's a lot of training that has to happen before we even get to the point of sending them out to calls. Um, I, I believe that Russ Vernon Jones mentioned sending the crest director out for ride alongs, which is very important for them, for the crest director to understand how, who, what they can respond to. Cause we can all sit here and say that they can respond to something and the crest director can go out and then do a ride along and say, there's no way that they can respond to these or they absolutely should be responding to these. So unfortunately, a lot of the stuff that we're talking about there, we haven't really finalized and it's just kind of moving us off um, topic. I do know that the crest and the police are gonna have to work together. This is gonna be a little more dependent on the police department than we had intended anticipated or that the community might have would have liked. Um, but again, the community has asked for this and for so that the BIPOC community could feel a little could feel safer, right? So we're I just feel like we've kind of shifted off of where we were supposed to be with it in under the noise complaint, right? And so again, I just want us all to remember that the noise complaint is a very broad topic. And so there's lots of different calls that can fall underneath that. Um, and that was really all I wanted to add. Yeah, thanks, Jen. And I'll just back you up in, in that um, as much as we can focus on the reorg plan that the town manager has proposed, which has the CRESS program, as we've discussed in terms of organization, um, we have a lot of other stuff to get through in terms of other questions. So, um, Dorothy? And I have a couple of comments. Um, one, these are financial. Um, Right now, there's been many people suggested that the <clears throat> rental registration fee be per unit, not per dwelling. And that would increase funds and that thus allow us to hire a second worker to respond to uh, the student um, parties. Um, many people have been mentioning this to me lately because the parties are bad. Um, and there have also been some, I've got some incredible pictures I've got to send on to the town manager of trashing all over the place done just this week. Um, and a suggestion that landlords be fined in such cases. So there's a, there's a great desire coming from the groundswell that maybe the parties are wilder and messier and maybe we had need a stronger response. But um, right now, when police go out in a call, I thought they went in pairs. They don't go alone, do they? So, I mean, the fact that you would be a policeman and a crest worker, that's not doubling the number of people going on a call, is it? I mean, this is, this is a real question. I'm not being rhetorical. Mike, do you want to answer that? Oh, that that's correct. They go in pairs. Um, we okay. always send two offices to a noise complaint. Right. Um, so, so whatever kind of thing it is going, to, where you might send a crest worker, you might send one police person and one crest worker. I mean, I don't see how it necessarily has to raise the costs, is, is, is what I'm saying. Um, I, I think the program is very important. And um, I do think Jennifer made a really good point about there's a broad range of noise complaints. Um, and we haven't really talked about the ones that aren't students, the ones that result in, in, in violence. Um, we haven't really talked about that very much, but that's part of what the CREST program, I believe, is intended to help with. Can I Mike jump did. in for one sec? I know we don't want to get in the weeds about noise complaints, but a, a disturbance between two people needing mental health help in the center of town would not be coded as a noise complaint. That wouldn't go out as a noise complaint. So noise complaints are pretty much when somebody's hearing something or they can specifically tell us this is what's going on other things fall into unknown suspicious disturbance though they're again we're coming back to the type of calls that crest is going to be trained in the type of calls that crest is going to be going to um but i think we're getting too far into the noise complaints like other people commented there's a lot to them 
Tim, did you want to say anything else? Your hand still raised. I didn't know if it was just Yeah, from I just wanted to add perhaps that the two mental health example in the center of town wasn't the best example to use for saying that that was something that could come in as a noise complaint and then be seen. But yeah. I think that you uh, pe folks understand what I'm trying to say is that it doesn't have to be related to the students and it can be something from my understanding that the calls come in many different ways to find out that there's different factors. But again, I think also we are moving way too far deep, as Mike just said, into the weeds of noise complaints when we don't have it all figured out either yet, right? And so we should probably move on um, to the yeah. next question before or we, subject. Before we go to the next question, Brianna or Alicia, I saw you both had your hand raised. Did, did either of you want to say anything? Um, um, I think Jen said exactly what I wanted to say. Thank you okay. for calling on me though. Yep. All right, so the next question is how will the how will the town handle future year equipment and vehicle costs. Um, so the initial equipment costs and vehicle costs we're anticipating using the ARPA money for um, that will get us whatever the you know whatever is worked out with the implementation team and, and what the department needs are. Um, future years after that, it'll be part of our, our capital planning process. It'll be part of the cyclical um, or annual process where we look at the needs and and when it's time to replace those vehicles, they'll they'll be proposed for replacement. So um, th they'll be handled like any other department. Um, I don't see any hands up. So, and Donna Ray's here. So this next one, maybe Donna Ray wants to start with, um, what are the proposed salaries and how are they determined? And you're muted, Donna Ray. I'm so sorry for that. I always mean to not do that, and and it happens. So, um, for the we're speaking specifically about Crest and not about the Office of DEI, right? Um, maybe if you if you have both, maybe do both. I think this yes, question was. Right. Yeah. So so um, for the Crest program, the implementation project manager, non-union, the salary range is 61,865 to 83,141. Um, I'll, first, I'll name the salaries, and then I'll give you the thinking behind them. Is that okay? Um, the, the Crest director, the, it's a non-union position as well, and the salary range could be from 74,895 to $100,652 annual. And then the program assistant position will be part of the SEIU union. And that position, um, the range is 48,993 through 65,842. And those are all ranges that come out of our pay classification system. So um, the town of Amherst has a longstanding compensation and pay system in place. It's based on um, the position classifications and the review includes the essential functions of the position, the requirements for the position. The pay classification system includes seniority steps. There's a longevity um, reward for a certain length of service. Um, and so, and also in addition with that, um, every year for the past 12 years, um, non-union and unions have had a cost of living um, increase. So that's, that is something to, um, for me to make sure that you understand as well. And so the way we, so first we, um, job descriptions were presented, developed, reviewed. We went back and forth. Jen um, Boyston kind of collaborated with the community safety working group and um, we came to kind of decisions on the job descriptions. And then based on those, we came up with those ratings. Um, whether they're a level five or, or a level seven or in the SEIU level G. And I have all of the job descriptions that I am happy to share out and um, our pay classification system if anyone is interested in looking at it. And we have a municipal rating scale that we put each job description through to come up with the, to come up with the rate. Yes, Thanks. Jen. Thanks, Donna Ray. Um, Matt or Jen, were you gonna add to that or? Yeah, I just wanted to add that, you know, there's a, a small presentation that kind of walks through the steps of how we classify. Um, that's a public document. And I'm just trying to think of. Uh, it's the project overview for the personnel board, I believe. That's a public document. Mm -hmm. 
on the web, town website. Yeah, maybe we can send that out. Um, Donna Ray, if you can, or Jen, either one of you, if you can send a copy, we could send that to the committee so people have Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Do you want me to send that along with the job descriptions and our pay classification systems for uh, non-union and SEIU? Yeah, yeah, sure. Anything okay. you reference would be great. All right. Um, Matt, do you have a question? I do. Thanks, Sean. And thank you all so much for this. I mean, this is a really exciting, super complicated, but it's a really exciting um, project. And I think something that, you know, we can be really proud of um, someday. But I get uh, this. I live in this world of, you know, staffing highly skilled mental health clinicians. And I, and I look at some of the job descriptions for these folks. Um, and, and I'm just curious in terms of the salary lines. Um, I mean, obviously, I'm appreciative of the town's salary schedule, SEIU, and, and all of that. But I'm just wondering um, if, if the CSWG or others did any kind of a, um, a staffing study. And Sean, I, I sent you obviously it was kind of last minute, but I'm sure you saw my questions. But this is one of this is probably my biggest question on the Crest team is you know putting together this group of ten uh, responders with this level of expertise and there is a part of me that's that thinks that Bernie's sort of buy or build question is also relevant here in terms of finding, you know, 10 people with this level of uh, skill and, and background. But I guess my, my simple question is, was there a salary analysis done of similar, um, you know, functions in other towns? Donna, well, right, you I, wanna... So I can say that when we, what we, we went through the municipal rating system that we use, that's our system, but we also looked to other towns. It was difficult. And we went out to, you know, Colorado, to a very different, to, you know, because they have different um, costs of living as well. But we did try to take those into consider. In fact, we did take those into consideration as well when we were um, rating. So maybe not that, so we didn't hire a consultant to do that. We did it ourselves, but we did take, you know, the market into consideration, but there's not much of a market map because we're kind of a little bit new in this um, field. Well, I would think of things like CSO and other sort of organizations that have adult mental health service um, clinicians, you know, who go out on, on this mobile crisis, that sort of thing. I mean, those are, those are the, that's the, that's the mar labor market, I would think. Peers. Yeah. Kathy? You're muted, Kathy. Yeah, I lowered my hand and unfailed and then muted myself. Um, not not quite what I meant to do. Um, this is a little bit out of the field of the specific jobs we're talking about here. But in my prior life working with healthcare organizations, um, there was often um, an ability um, to quickly learn on the job if there was some mentoring um, so that people, particularly in community health centers, community mental health centers, primary care clinics, took people who had had some basics and, and they um, moved them up. And there's actually an SEIU local out in Cape Cod that did it with uh, moving from aid up to nurse, you know, but really thinking that you didn't necessarily come in with everything you ultimately had. So I don't know the extent we can be doing that here, but because we're, some of these jobs will be unique. Um, they're not gonna be exactly what they were in other organizations. Um, if we can think of ways to um, do that on the job, uh, mentoring, shadowing, um, if, if there's something similar. So, so that's, I'm, as I said, I'm just jumping in, trying to think of, because they, one group in particular, it was uh, in high risk communities that weren't even responsive to medical personnel. They took uh, community members and trained them and they went out and they were the primary care people that went to people's homes to deal with asthmatic kids or kids who were um, at behavior risk, but the parents trusted them. So it's, it's a slightly different model than towns typically use where you try to find the person who has everything you want on day one. Um, as opposed to a, a training track. So I don't know whether we could set up something like that or whether four years from now, we could be thinking that way as we learn. And um, Jen, did you wanna um, respond oh, to that? I did, I just wanted to respond to 
um, Councillor Shane. So that is something that we have thought about and we have talked about because there's something nice about having people that we see in the community every day. Um, we There's already an establishment of trust there try to come so it's kind of more fitting like could that possibly be could we hire a clinician and then a community member to train further but again not all of that has been decided yet so but it is something that we have thought about because there's something to be said there and also it empowers the community members which empowers the responder so there's an all-around circle of um empowerment that occurs when we when you do something like that but we still have to further discuss that out Kathy? Along that line, you know, when, when I'm talking about the primary care clinic, sometimes what they found is the community member had worked as a nurse's aide in a home health care center. Um, you know, so they they already had, they knew they had people skills. You know, they had a desire to, to work with it, but they were um, sometimes, you know, basically a high school education, not necessarily a junior college, but I mean, it was really trying to think of that you could uh, learn your way to higher levels that we undervalue people's native skills um, and people are capable of learning if you give them the opportunity to learn. So and there was uh, been a lot of success in this outside the United States, as well as um, the tribes up in Alaska did a huge amount of this, even around dental care. So I'm just thinking that maybe we can think creatively um, as we uh, find our way through uh, this program. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, Dorothy? I just want to remind people that our community colleges are set up to do this, and that there are many, many programs at HCC and at Greenfield, which have been specially, <clears throat> specially created to solve a local need. For example, you know, there are students now studying the marijuana trade at HCC because that program is set up because of the towns around here that have um, started the legalized um, Marijuana, and of course, we have many nursing and human services programs. So, I, I would really strongly urge that the committee to talk with um, one or both of our local community colleges, and you could you could help design with them a program that would do exactly what you want, which would be bringing in local people, uh, at least from the area, and of course, people in our community could go to the community college. The tuition could be paid. By um, you know, by us if need be, uh, but as you know, the tuition is quite low. It is quite low, and some of these programs there is no tuition because the state has seen to value it, and the state pays it. So um, I, I think that's a good way to go. Yeah, I'll echo Dorothy's comments real quickly. Um, the schools we work with GCC to create a program from scratch, um, a dual enrollment program, and they came and worked with us and gave us what we needed and allowed kids to take courses at the school, um, which gave them new opportunities. So they they definitely are flexible in that way where they let us design what we need, so. All right, the next question, does the town manager have sufficient flexibility to supervise another direct report? And he's not here, but I think the answer, he better because he proposed it. So <laughs> he, um, if he doesn't, he should have let us know before he, uh, he proposed it. Uh, Lynn, do you wanna weigh in on that too? Uh I absolutely believe that Paul has exceeded his span of control and I've told him that. <laughs> he has too many direct reports and he needs to seriously look at how to change that mm -hmm. so that people can be properly mentored along the way. Bernie? Yeah, I'm, I raised this question and um, my concern is that of, of Lynn's. I, it's not, a, uh, not a, a critique of Paul's abilities or his, his willingness to do work. He's a very, very capable guy. And he's demonstrated that repeatedly. But I think what we're doing is we're building up um, a system that's going to require some additional managerial assistance in there. Um, as far as I know, he still needs to sleep at least four to six hours a day. Yeah. Uh, he may not be doing that now, but uh, it, I, I, I do think that we've overextended the manager's position, regardless of who's in it. Alicia? Um, I just have a follow-up question uh, proposed to, I think um, I think it would be Bernie or whoever proposed this question in the first place, is that what information would you be looking for to be in another direct report? Alicia, are you saying um, what information 
would the committee yeah, need to know whether he um, Paul has the ability to handle another um, position or overseeing another position? Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, probably the best thing would be to hear from Paul at some point, I imagine. Um, I know we had a conflict for today, but Paul's probably the best to speak to the committee about that. Bernie, so did is you that have any something that would be required of him for in order for this to move forward or why I'm, I'm trying to understand why exactly we're asking this question right now. So I believe he's going to be at the TSO committee on Thursday. So that would be an opportunity where that question mm -hmm. could be addressed as well if it comes up. We're, okay. we're actually we're actually adding two um, two direct reports to the manager's workload. We have this and we have the uh, DEI person in our department that's coming on. And I'm not saying that that's uh, something that keeps us from going forward. It is a concern about sustainability. It's also a concern that at some point in the time, we're gonna to have to replace Paul because he ain't always gonna be with us. And we don't wanna set up a, a set of conditions where uh, things get dropped because a well-meaning person is overworked. Uh, we don't wanna set up conditions where we won't be able to find an adequate replacement because the job seems overwhelming. And like I said, that's not a knock on anyone. Uh, we all, you know, we're all humans and we all have our limits. And um, it's not a, it's not a, it's not, I, I, it's not intended to be an impediment to, to put this, this program or any other program in place. It is a concern that we might at some point need to consider a, a public safety director. Um, we may need to look at, you know, I'm looking at the, uh, the charter, Commission's final report, organizational chart, and um, there looks like there's a you know um, we we don't have a real good TO for the town, but it looks like there's lots of direct reports to uh, to to the uh, uh, to the manager, and that's a concern. Okay. Um, Lynn, yeah, uh, Alicia, I want to be very clear: this is not a showstopper for going forward with this program or with the DEI program. It is not a showstopper. It is a question that comes out of, in my case, years of running organizations and being an organizational development consultant. And I just look at this and I say, too many direct reports, you've got to figure out a way. Because what it means then is all of those people who are direct reports are not getting as much from Paul as he should and should be giving them in terms of his mentoring and his guidance in terms of helping them grow. And that is particularly important when you have a town manager who has many years of experience under his belt as, Tom, as Paul does. So it, it doesn't stop me from saying, go ahead. It just stops me from saying, it just brings up for me the big picture, how that big picture is resolved may have nothing to do where Cress is reporting, but it's something that has to be looked at, and I think sooner rather than later. Matt, oh, I, I think it's just a, it's a good question in terms of how many people directly report to the town manager. So it's not a written report; it's, it's how many individuals directly report. To the, that's a it's a good question. Um, just just to follow up on, on what I was asking previously, I guess. Um, there may be more detail in the um, in the working group uh, proposal itself, and I can go back and look at that. And you all know I'm I'm so new, um, but I would be curious if there is a um, a level of credential that we're specifically trying to hire for with these responders. I, I do appreciate you know the grow your own and mentoring and things like that, but you know if we're thinking about mental health emergency situations, I would be interested in knowing what what level of credential is, is mandatory for staffing this. Um, and then a related question I have, this kind of relates, this is kind of the same theme as a lot of our um, funding with, with uh, ARPA and other things, but a related question I have is how would this group function with less than 10 responders on staff? You know, let's say that we, we make, we're able to make four initial hires and then we kind of hit a wall in terms of finding folks. So. You know, is, are there interim plans? And I don't mean as a cost saving measure. I mean as a as a hiring, you know, just a hiring reality measure. I'm just curious, you know, if there is an interim thing around that. But I, I would definitely like to see the detail on 
what level of credential these folks um, are expected to have to do this work. Alicia. Um, thank you. I just wanted to go back, sorry, to uh, my original question and Lynn's answer, which thank you, Lynn, was very helpful. Um, but so just to make sure that I'm understanding is that we're talking about the reporting requirements in general and not specifically because there are two additional reports due for the Crest Department and for the DEI Department of the Town Manager. So we will want to be thinking about alternative requirements for the Town Manager or figuring out in which instances it's absolutely necessary for him to have a direct report and that this might not necessarily be one of those incidents incidences where it's absolutely necessary. Um, and if that is what we're talking about, I'm also just slightly confused. Would we just remove it as a requirement needed to move forward and we would move forward? Or I'm trying to figure out why exactly that question holds significance at a meeting specifically for the Crest Department and the DEI Department. It's the larger picture. It has nothing to do with this specific program. And it and that larger picture, by the way, could have financial implications. Thank you, Lynn. Jen? I just wanted to kind of touch base or to speak on what Mr. Holloway has spoken on in regards to the credentials. So they would have to be, I think we're looking at clinicians, licensed clinicians, licensed social workers to um, be at least one of the responders at minimum, if not both people are responders on a team, depending on the day, you know. So one person absolutely has to either be a licensed clinician or social worker. Mike? So just follow up, so just following up on what Jim was saying, um, all that stuff's gonna go into a job description. We've talked a little bit in the implementation group about the uh, job qualifications qualifications of the candidates. As far as starting out with less than eight or less than 10, I imagine that's gonna happen. I imagine that as this program starts, they'll get four or five really qualified candidates and we can move forward. The LEAP study actually um, kind of picks out the uh, areas of highest activity. So I'd imagine that the director would say, okay, we're gonna start out and the first two teams will work, you know, 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. or something like that on a rotating basis. So. Uh, the LEAP study did kind of look at the, uh, the areas of high activity and the, and the best ways to staff. So we were talking earlier, if we just had eight staff, that there's probably going to be a block to start out that won't be covered by any CREST members. If there'll be an on-call type situation or a responder sitting at the CREST office or something like that um, for those things. Good. Um, so Andy, the last um, major question is on the... Um sort of the fiscal sustainability. So I've got a, um, I was gonna share my screen and just go over some charts and some some assumptions and things like that. Is that okay? So can everybody see this? Is this large enough for everybody to see? Uh -huh. Yes. Okay, good, thank you. Um, so this is a, work in progress. It's developed enough that um, I talked to Paul, I feel comfortable sort of sharing with this committee and getting your feedback on it. Um, but it's something that's still being worked on. But I think this will give you a sense of the direction and the magnitude of what we're thinking in terms of um, the impact of adding these two departments um, on the finances going forward. So just a couple of general things to go over. So um, in terms of timing of costs, we're assume right now this model that you'll see in a second, we're assuming that Crescent DEI will be fully phased into the operating budget in FY23 in terms of their, their staffing costs and their health insurance costs. Um, the pension costs would hit in FY24, and that's just based on the timing of how the pension, um, how the town gets assessed for pension costs. Um, four new firefighters, so we, we folded that into this, this analysis because that was also discussed. So we wanted you to see the, the full picture of sort of these new positions that have been discussed. So. Um, the four new firefighters that are being funded through ARPA, they would be folded into the operating budget and FY25. In terms of how we're using grants as, as of this point to support uh, the implementation of these two new departments, um, we have the Department of Public Health grant, which is 450,000. 
that's helping support implementation of the CREST program and the mental health services um, that will support the, um, the CREST program. Uh, we're using ARPA for startup costs for CREST, which will include equipment, outfitting space, um, training, any of those really large um, upfront costs to create a new department. Um, and ARPA is also funding part of a DEI position in FY22, and that, that part will be folded into the FY23 operating budget. Uh, and ARPA is funding the four additional firefighters in FY22 through FY24, um, and then in FY25, they would, they would be folded into the operating budget. We also have a uh, state earmark for the community responder program to help fund the additional positions in FY22. It was about 90,000. Um, if you recall, we had funding in the budget for, depending on the length of time and when the program started, um, somewhere between four to six um, positions for the CREST program. Um, and then there were four additional that the council had said we should fill. And so this funding is gonna make sure that we can fund that full program this year. Um, and then there may be other sources of funds going forward for CRESS. Um, I was on a webinar a couple of weeks ago about the possibility of federal funding, um, sort of like how when EMTs go out and provide a service, we, we can bill insurance depending on what they provide. Um, there may be similar revenue streams um, for the CRESS response. A lot of it will come down to, is it a mental health, um, a credentialed mental health provider who is um, providing a service? Um, that we could then potentially bill insurance for. Uh, and Medicaid is, there's a, a new program related to this alternative police response um, in Medicaid that's gonna be starting soon that we'll explore as this program rolls out. So in terms of forecasting, um, the impact on the budget, sort of a two-step approach. So the first chart you're, you're gonna see is the high level budget. So that's our overall revenues and our overall expenses and then trying to drill down and see, can we afford a 2.5% increase each year going forward for the town municipal budget? And then the second analysis is gonna be, all right, so if we can do a 2.5% increase to the town municipal budget, if we look at our municipal expenses and project those out forward, can, you know, are we in balance or will that part of the budget be stressed? So the first piece here is that, that higher level that you're, you're more used to seeing. Um, I've consolidated a little bit here to, for simplicity, but um, we've taken our revenues here at the top and we've got the FY22 budget, what we had projected for FY23 during the financial indicators report. Um, the one exception is we put in an assumption for state aid increase here that we didn't have during the financial indicators report. So this is a little bit higher. Um, and then we've projected out the next four years. And you'll see the assumptions on the, on the next page. But for property taxes, we've assumed the 2.5% increase plus an estimate for new growth. For local receipts, we've projected um, continued recovery in FY24, sort of a larger than normal growth for FY23 and FY24 as we get back to where we were before the pandemic. And then it sort of flattens out into smaller um, recovery steps each year after that. State aid, we've projected about a 2% increase that it really fluctuates um, year to year, depending on what our charter and choice um, funds are. Um, chapter 70 doesn't grow much, but we've projected 2% increase. And, and all these assumptions can be tweaked. So again, that's where if there's feedback, if you wanna see assumptions run differently, we can. Um, and then other financing sources, the big things in there are ambulance fund that took a hit during the pandemic. So we have that uh, projected uh, recovery projected there. And then we also have our enterprise fund reimbursements that we have a recovery projected there. So revenues going up somewhere between two and a half, three million dollars a year, um, which you can see is in line with what we're projecting for FY23 as well. On the expenditure side, um, we have the operating budgets being uh, having two and a half percent increases each year going forward, other than FY23 where we have the 2.5% increase for the town plus the $300,000 that we talked about during financial indicators. So it's a little bit more for the town in FY23. Uh, the capital budget, I wouldn't get too worried about the numbers in terms of the, the, the debt service and things like that. That's all always sort of in flux. Um, the most important piece here is that our assumption is we're gonna be at 10% of the levy for FY23 and then 10.5% in FY24 and beyond. And that's a major assumption of, uh, um, of the plan to fund the four capital projects. So the four capital projects, they're not in here in terms of their projected debt and things like that, but the major assumption was we need to get to 10.5% um, for capital spending if we wanna 
stick to that plan. And then we have our retirement system where we have 7% increases, except for there's two years where the, the new departments, the assessment related to those two new departments hits. So in FY24, there's a larger than normal increase when the Crescent DEI positions hit. And then in FY25, there's a larger than normal increase when the fire department positions hit. OPEB stays the same. Um, we have a 2% increase um, estimated for state assessments. Again, that fluctuates based on charter and choice tuition. So some years it's flat, some years it goes down, some years it grows. So um, it, it, a lot of that, again, it's just an assumption or a guesstimate at this point. So the, the net result is that we've got about a three hundred dollars to $400,000 deficit. Um, I think my main takeaway from this is that it, that is not overly concerning at this point. We're very early in the budget process. Um, the hope our conservative estimates hopefully between new growth and state aid increases coming in a little bit better than what we're 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 budgeting for that some of the this gap will be closed so um the other positive thing looking at this is that the gap isn't growing over time i think that's probably the most important thing is it's staying about flat um so that if we close this gap for fy23 that will help close the gap in all these future years um going out so my takeaway from this is that we can do the two and a half percent increases to operating budgets that um, we've been planning on. Any questions on this first piece before I go to the more detailed uh, or the the more the the department level projection? I can't see anybody, so if there is, just call out. Yeah, um, well, there's several people who have their hands up, and I'll uh, throw in one question right off the bat, and then I'm gonna go to the other two people and come back if they don't ask and my additional questions. Um, this year, uh, we uh, have created some discomfort in our relationship with uh, some members of the school committee because we uh, proposed a disproportionate share of $300,000 additional from municipal, plus we have all of the ARP and other funds. Um, is that three hundred thousand dollars then the base on which you're adding two and a half percent each year? Yep. Yeah, that so would the, be a that would be a permanent increase to the base for the town. Okay. Um, so we we know that there's going to be some tensions around that, uh, but we won't go further than that right now. Um, I had some other questions, but I don't want to hog. So I'm going to um, see Brianna. Hi. Hi, thank you, Andy. Um, Sean, my question to you is, I'm just, thank you so much for walking us through this and explaining it. I'm wondering where the 130,000 from the frozen police positions fall in, in regards to the Crest program and the budget for the program. So I'll, that's a good question, Brianna. I will identify that in the next chart. So this is, um, this is sort of the high level full view of the budget. The police department and the Crest program, all those um, smaller level budgets, they're all within this town line. Um, under operating budget in this where it's uh, 26 million for FY23 in the blue, the shaded blue, all those numbers are within that 26 million. Um, and then on the next slide, I'll show you a, a, a little bit more detailed breakout of the departments that make that number up. Awesome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, and Andy, just quickly following up on your point um, and for the finance committee to know, we have scheduled a BCG, a budget coordinating group meeting for next week. Um, where representatives of the council, the, the school committee, and the library trustees will meet. Um, to, we haven't had one of these in a little while, a uh, separate one of these in a little while, but we're going to talk about some of these issues because this is a um, uh, different type of budget year from what we've done in the past. Kathy? Um, I know you're going to show us the what lies underneath these on your next chart. Sean, so I just want to make sure I heard correctly. This the line called town mm -hmm. has all the new positions in it. Um, at some point in FY25, 26, 27. We we you're assuming Yeah, so you haven't, so let me just clarify. So you haven't seen the impact of that yet. So what this is showing is the funding side of it. The um this is how much funding is going to be available to the town. The next chart I'm going to show you in a second is, all right, well, that's our funding. How do our expenses compare to that funding? How do our actual expenses when we add these two new departments compare to it? Um, so what you're seeing here is just the 
the two and a half percent each year, um, but you're not seeing the the compare that comparison yet. You'll you'll get that in one second. No, I didn't mean on the revenue line. I was going to cross on the town line. So no, even on the even on the town line again, the expense. So this okay. is an expense for the town budget. But what that means is, all right, the town budget gets this much money, and then we have to fit our expenses within that allocation. Um, and same thing with the schools. The, the, the maybe, schools maybe get this, so much. Maybe it will become clearer because it will. Yeah. If we're adding a million dollars in spending, um, yes, it will. Yeah, be... you'll see it. You'll see that in one second. Okay. Any other, Grant? I don't know if you had another question. Your hand was still raised. No, nope, that that is. I want to see how you're doing that, and then what your sources going forward. That's my concern: is that we've got an unfunded um, obligation. It, it, it's funded fine to start out with because we've got ARPA money, we've got some state allocations and others, but I'm worried about what happens three years out. Sure. No, I, I, I think you're you're right to that. That's the right question. Um, Andy? Yeah, I mean, the other thing is, is I was curious whether you looked at either Coots or STAR, this program has been around the longest and uh, have any observations from looking at those programs as to how those communities have been able to sustain it over time. Yeah, I mean, I've looked at them a little bit. I think, again, we're, we're sort of beyond um, the, the town exploring those models. Uh, at this point, it seems like, based on the what's been proposed for a reorganization plan. Um, again, those are very different. It's a very different model than what we're proposing here. So, um, but if we want to come, if we want to make that a future agenda, I'm happy to bring more information back on that. So I'll, no other hands raised, so I'll keep going. So again, this shows a deficit, but again, the deficit to me is stable. If if our numbers come in better in FY23, it's gonna close that. Um, so I'm not overly concerned at this point looking at this. Um, this is just some of the assumptions I talked about, some of the, what we're estimating going forward in terms of increases. Again, these change and then the, the numbers change, but um, we think these are reasonable at this time. So this is the, the second piece of this. So Kathy, your question. So this gray bar at the top, this is the municipal operating budget allocation. So this gray bar is how much money is being allocated to the municipal budget. So this, these numbers tie to that town line on the prior, um, the prior chart. So you'll see the larger increase for FY23 and then two and a half percent increases each year for FY24 through 27. And then what we've done is we've taken our expenditures and we have increased them each year. Um, and we focus on sort of the two major categories. Um, we know there's other things that will, will go up and down, but we focused on two major categories for now, um, payroll and health insurance. That's you know 80 to 90% of, of our budget or payroll and health insurance. So we've taken our baseline staffing budget and we've increased it. And I'll show you what we've increased it by and then we've included an estimate of increases for health insurance. Um, and then we've done that each year going forward um, through FY27. We've also in FY23, we've added the CREST program. Um, in FY25, we've added the additional firefighters. So those years you'll see the, um, that there's been additional expenditures added in each of those years in addition to the regular increases. So for payroll and health insurance, for payroll, what we've done is all of our sort of standard payroll lines, we've increased three and a half percent roughly. Um, this is based on our general, generally we do about a 2% COLA that will fluctuate year to year, but um, generally about a 2% COLA. And then I looked at the, um, what the average steps are for each union or group we have, and then how many people are lined up to get a step. Um, to kind of get down to the net step that we would see um, on the whole. And so that, that number will change as younger people come in or sorry, newer people come in and um, people at the top of the step go out. Um, that will change over time. So again, this is a, something we can play around with, but um, this is roughly what I used at the schools too, was about three and a half percent. And again, it will change as your workforce turns over. So Applying that to each of these sections, um, you can see what the increases are. Um, so for FY24, um, it's going to increase about 785,000. 
that gives us a gap of 111,000 between the funding we have available and what our sort of level services expenses would be um, with these new departments. Same thing for FY25, that starts to grow. Um, FY26 continues and so on into FY27. Um, so we do have issue, we do have challenges that we're gonna have to figure out because you can see this is a gap that's growing. It's not staying the same. Um, and it's sort of as we expected. I don't think any of us expected that we would be able to add these two new departments and it would just all fit and fall into place um, without having to make any other adjustments. So the things we'll have to explore as we go forward in order to make this all work are what everybody's already said already. One would be to increase revenues. Um, we can look to um, fee increases. I know that's been talked about several times is, is looking at our fees and how those might be increased. Um, I mentioned the Medicaid program and how that might be able to provide some funding for this. Um, and then we also have the strategic agreements that need to be worked out in the coming year that might be able to provide some funding. So, so one option to address this gap is to increase revenues. Um, and then the other option is to, re to adjust expenses, to reduce expenses, um, shift them to, to close this gap. Um, and then Brianna, your question. So right now, and this will change before the official budget is voted, but right now the CREST program is still in community services because that's where we had put it last year before we really knew what form it was gonna take. Um, so this community service line, you can see it's a big bump from FY22 to FY23. That's because that's where the, the staffing for the CREST program is, is going. Um, and that 130,000 from the police department is in that as part of that line. Um, going forward when, so one thing we're gonna do is this model that we're projecting as we move into the budget process and we get state aid numbers and things like that, we will refine this and this will probably be um, some form or fashion be part of the budget document that we uh, bring forward for FY23. And we'll have more um, accurate numbers at that point because of um, just more recent information. Um, but by that time, we will um, have moved CRESS up into the public safety sec uh, section of this budget. So we do intend on moving CRESS up to public safety and that will shift these expenses accordingly. Any questions on that? If the shifting doesn't affect the bottom line. No, it won't affect the bottom line. Just wanted yeah, people to be aware that it will change a little bit. Um, Sean, just um, on the, when you went up above, this is constantly putting 10% into capital? This is putting 10 and a half percent into capital. Um, yeah, for FY24 and beyond, it's getting it's putting 10 and a half percent to capital because that's what we had uh, projected in our plan for the four building projects. Okay, thank you. Um, one last question. Oh, sorry, Andy. Capital. Yeah, Olivia, so I'm, uh, since you're on capital and uh, go to Bob and Dorothy. Um, the uh, vehicle needs for for crest responders, uh, I don't know how many vehicles you put forward in the first year and what your um, uh, capital needs are going out. Yeah, so um, so my original estimates were two. Um, so thinking there'd be two teams at one time, possibly um, on, I think that might, I think the implementation team needs to, and the director that's hired will ultimately need to weigh in on what the right, um, vehicle level is, um, but I think it, in the reorg plan, I think we had assumed two. Okay, Bob? Yeah, the question I have, Sean, is does this, um, this projection assume the same number of crest responders every year, or is there an in increase over time um, in terms of the number of responders? No, this this keeps the number of response. This keeps the department size at ten. Okay. Yep. It keeps it at eight responders with a director and an administrative um, position. Okay. So yeah. if there are if there is any growth in that, then that would throw things off even further. Is that correct? Yeah, that number um, would have to be added in. Yep. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Dorothy. Um, I remember the fire department hired some people. And we were told, no, 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 those are not considered new uh, places. They're there to float to cover sick days and um, holidays and that kind of thing. Um, I don't think the Crest program has any personnel to do that. So I, it, 
that seems a problem to me. But the other thing is um, your, your performance of this budget suggests that you are not disturbed, you are not worried, that this financing is actually reasonable and that we should not be concerned because this is how budgets go. And as long yeah, as you know- I apologize if that's how it came off. I think the, the higher level one, I'm not as concerned about. I think these numbers are concerning. Um, okay, I'm not that's a, what I needed to know. I'm not a, I'm, I don't get super, um, <laughs> sure. I try not to be very one-sided, I guess, on either of these things. I try to just uh, lay it okay. out that we I'm will not, have I'm to, not, yeah. we will have to make in, uh, increase revenues or decrease expenses um, and right. the gap of 666,000 in particular for just the town budget is a significant gap okay. um, and I think the other thing that I'll mention um, Dorothy that's a good point that you raised um, the other concern that I have looking at this is that there's lots of other things that we that the town council wants to do um, and, and the town manager wants to do everybody wants to do um, mm -hmm. in terms of sustainability improvements um, housing initiatives there's, there's lots of other things we want to do this leaves um, as you can see zero flexibility to do anything else um, you know okay, we have to exactly. make adjustments just to get to hit these numbers mm -hmm. um, so it would really limit flexibility going forward um, or it's going to limit flexibility going forward until we figure out where those additional revenues are going to come from and, and what expenses are going to be um, adjusted. So I, I did not mean it as a criticism. So so as I understand this, um, you're saying this is how it could be done. These are how the numbers could go. But I think the statement you said there is it removes flexibility is very important. Because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just comparing this when you did the four capital projects, you know, with the the, the quote unquote tool. Um, there you were convincing us that we could do it. Um, yeah, I think the difference here is um, we don't have a plan yet for how to do this, uh, okay. I think is the, so this is sort of our first analysis of, all right, if we're going to move forward with these two new departments um, and the four additional firefighters, what is our challenge or our problem that we're going to have mm -hmm. to address? Um, we at this currently don't have the, the solution. I guess with the four building projects, we had a plan um, that okay. we felt was, at this time, that will be our next step is to work on this plan, how okay. we're going to do this each year. Thank you very much. Yep. Bernie? Uh, you're muted still, Bernie. I'm muted. My screen is telling me I'm muted. Um, I, I think your 5% your increase in health insurance is optimistic. Um, yeah, it may be. It's it's higher than what we've seen historically. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, actually, I'm I'm thinking it's conservative based on our actual. Um, but I also plan on that, including if mm -hmm. new plans get added, retirees. You know, we're, our retiree um, pool is going to increase. But um, our experience the last several years has been pretty, pretty good. But you're right. Anything could happen with health insurance. There could be sure. some sort yeah, of no, catastrophe I, I, where it goes up ten percent. We we have we being municipalities have been pretty lucky in terms of health insurance over the last few years. Uh, uh, the other thing is there was mention of using reserves to cover some of these costs and um, uh, startup costs, mm -hmm. which is uh, uh, would be somewhat of a departure from the town's standard practice. Um, I don't know that that's a horrible thing, but um, I mean, that's one way of covering some of these gaps until um, Somebody waves a magic wand and more money appears. Yeah, um, we may need to use reserves for FY23, depending on um, how state aid comes in. So if state aid comes in really well and new growth comes in better than expected, um, we may not need to use um, reserves. Um, but if it doesn't come in as well as we might hope, then um, this gap here of 383, this is with an increase in state aid. So we still have this gap we have to we have to close before we bring the budget back. Uh, Dorothy, I don't know if your hand is still raised, Dorothy. Uh, Kathy? Um, well, contrary to Dorothy listening to your calm voice saying all is well, I looked at the numbers that all, all is not well. Um, we have a, a really big hole. So I have a couple questions. You're not showing us the pension side of this. 
Um, so you said health insurance is in this. We start taking on the pension. Yeah. So, in, so the pension's up here in this retirement system. Right. Under miscellaneous. Okay. It's bef it's not in our smaller operating budgets. It's we do pensions before we divvy up the funds to the operating budgets. Um, so this pension assessment is for everybody, um, schools. Okay. Um, yep. So can you explain to me how on the aggregate page, the whole is 345,000 and on the town side, it's 600,000. Um, is yes. that because, it's because aggregate has the magic that nobody goes up by more than two and a half percent? So it's sort of, you're looking at two different things. So, the, um, so think about this one that you're looking at right now, the 345, this is, the, the budget the council votes and includes the schools and includes the library it's you know whether you whether the town can afford that budget that we're going to bring to you for everybody um, yep. and so that's all revenue all general fund revenues all general fund expenses um, and so we have a gap of 345 so that's 345 of a much bigger number so our budget's 88 million or and if you yep. go out to fy 20 seven, it's 99 million. So as a percentage of that overall budget, it's a relatively small percentage deficit that we've got to, we've got to figure out. Um, the $600,000 here is, this is just within, so again, this line item here, this 28,729,859, if you're looking at the FY27, yeah, I got it. Um, that is right here um, on the town line. So yeah. This deficit is whether the town can actually stick within that two and a half percent that's allocated to just the the municipal operation, and so the yep. the so the outcome there is that we have a six hundred sixty six thousand um, dollars. Again, I don't want to get stuck on the specific numbers. I would say this is yep. a to give you the ballpark and the direction of of what we're dealing with. Um, again, the assumptions could be better. Assumptions could get a little worse. Um, there's some things that, you know, this isn't, again, this is just, just payroll and health insurance. There's other things that could go up and down in the budget. Um, so this is just to give you a sense of the magnitude that there is likely going to be a significant deficit that we'll have to deal with. And that the two ways we're going to have to tackle that is through revenues and expenses. Right. Cause what I can see here is if you flipping back and forth with top line and bottom line, the town line, when you add up the new people comes up to 29.4 million versus you were only on page one saying 28.7. Right. Yeah. That, this, this gray line compared to this green, this green shading versus the gray shading is, yeah. the, is what you so that, to. So that's the, that's the concern. I think, you know, when we, when we talk about multiple year budgets, like what's the pressure underneath um, unless something magic happens with staffing. Um, so, and so that was just, uh, thank you for flipping back and forth because I couldn't see the 29 versus the 28, which is where the difference is. So Bernie's piece on reserves, my memory of the magic you did with the four capital projects was um, to first, we assumed some decent numbers for fire and DPW, and we we're gonna see whether we can even come down with them. And then you started pulling down on reserves for a few years to tide us over. Mm -hmm. um, so at the point we were taking on debt for those projects, um, we were using it over on the capital side to do the debt servicing. So I think we we need to be super careful, um, you know. And I'm and just as you, people know, I'm I'm head of the school building committee, and it's and as Sean's on it also, it's become I'm becoming increasingly aware of aside from our share of the building that MSBA is not paying for, it's what parts of the total cost will they not be willing to pay for? They, they have a cap that's artificially low on construction costs. They do not cover solar and some of the things we're gonna, so, 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 so I, I don't, I wanna stay flexible on those reserve side um, for one of the projects that may need to tap into it more than we're thinking. Um, right. So, so it's just, so I think this is a, a fairly, it's not scary, but it's, um, it's, it's a realistic picture of uh, not just has flexibility disappeared in the budget, but that we have a hole that we need to figure out how we're going to fill if we're, if we're going to do um, continue service levels, unless there's some magic that robots start doing a lot of our jobs. Um, right. And, and hopefully it you know, when I looked at this, 
to me, again, this makes sense if we're adding, we're adding 15 to 16 positions, um, again, between the Crest Department, um, DEI and the Fire Department position. So if you add that many positions, um, I think it's inevitable that we're gonna, we're gonna have to deal with something like this. Andy? Yeah, I mean, that, I guess there are a couple of things. One is that um, you said something a couple of minutes ago that sort of harkens back to the discussion I had about yesterday's guideline discussion at the council meeting. And that is that um, the council didn't really come to grips with the number of new programs that have been talked about and that it is interested in as a matter of um, sort of policy development going forward, of which uh, we're talking about two today, but there's also reparations, there's also ECAC, which you mentioned, and housing, which you mentioned, so that uh, it's not that, uh, it, you know, I, I worry about that because um, if those programs get funded in any significant way, each one has a little bit of an effect on that bottom line shortfall, doesn't close it, it enlarges it. Uh, the other thing um, though on the, on the other side of it is that, you know, as I've looked at, you know, thought about this question of reserves, um, it isn't a question just of using reserves, but it's a question of how much we add to reserves at the end of each year. And over a course of time, we've been building reserves purposefully because of the building projects. But at some point, um, we may not need to do that quite as much. And we might be able to take that free cash money each year and use a certain amount of free cash money to um, bring back to the budget and help reduce that bottom line. Um, so I was wondering what your comments were on that. Um, so we thought about that a lot too. I think, you know, I think generally we don't advise doing that for operating costs, um, building it in to support any of these operating costs. I think it is worth a discussion about doing it for capital um, for some years, maybe using some free cash to help um, maybe get done more in capital to sort of a, to reduce the overall need for capital spending, um, because you know, if if that if for whatever reason we don't have free cash in one particular year, um, that doesn't have the sort of immediate impact that if it was funding operate operations that it would, um, if you if you don't have that revenue source anymore. So, I think it's worth a conversation. Um, again, I agree with Kathy that we should see how the four building projects sort of pan out before we make any major. Um, uh, changes to how we treat reserves, but once we have a better sense of where those four building projects are and their costs, um, if we if we feel like our reserves are still ample and and uh, above the um, sort of our guidelines, then I think it, it probably is worth a conversation about using them to support um, maybe contributions to OPEB or contributions um, to capital. Dorothy. I just want to add that that um, what Sean is showing us is that it's a, it's a challenging problem. Uh, it can be done. There are things that are worrisome and that have to be watched carefully and closely. But I just wanted to mention that um, this is actually some exciting proposals. And Amherst is, again, leading the way. Um, I'm sure the road will be bumpy. I'm sure we'll have to we'll find out things are not exactly as predicted. But I think that we should be proud that we are attempting this um, in the attempt to, to have a more equitable um, way of, of doing business and reaching out to people in the community. So um, if it presents serious problems, we will have to deal with it and we'll have to make some hard choices. There's no doubt about that. But um, I think that it's uh, exciting that we're starting it and trying to do it and we'll watch it carefully and try to make it work. Okay, so other comments? Just looking at the entire group and seeing no further hands going up. So what are we going to report back to the, um, you know, that we, we were supposed to be able to report to, through TSO back to the council 
and to at least begin that process with the forum a few nights from now. So um, I think it's important that we at least know what our major conclusions or statements are. And um, it may be that it is just that sort of what we've been talking about most recently, looking at multi-year projections, we recognize that there is a deficit that continues to grow, um, that we don't know if adjustments are gonna have to be made that are gonna be either significant new revenue or um, making additional budget cuts. We need to um, just go forward and uh, make the best effort we can to achieve those results because this is the right thing to do. That's one way to uh, conclusion that we could draw from this. Um, and I think that that's, I mean, the other is to just sort of continue to make the point that we do have to look at not enlarging the budget or at least recognizing that further enlarging the budget is gonna exacerbate the problem just described. Lynn? I'd like to begin whatever statement we send to um, TSO with very positive uh, support for these two proposals and then recognize the challenge. But I wanna make sure that we send that first message. I think that's what Dorothy was saying too. Is there anybody from the Finance Committee that is willing to take a stab at writing this? Because uh, I can't do both it and the guidelines. I think my wavelength will be beyond the limit. I could work with someone on it. Don't say that, Dorothy. Just say, I'm going to take a stab at it. Okay, I, I'm, I'm a bit overloaded at this time. But that's that's the challenge, but- um, Yeah, I know the problem is, is that- uh, um, You are overloaded. We jump in too. fully. Um, yeah. We have a time limit on this in the- well, This the is for Thursday, this Thursday? Thursday. All right. I, but I'll volunteer. <laughs> I'll volunteer. Thank okay, you. We, you and I can talk about it, Kathy, as to whether okay. you'd rather do the guidelines or that. No, yeah, no, I, I can, you know, it's just, as Lynn said, the, the, the wording and tone is important. It's not just uh, the information. And I guess um, my question is, are we talking about kind of a one pager? Because I, I don't think I don't think what Sean has just shown us, um, or maybe I'll ask it as a question. I don't. Are we going to show what Sean has just showed us, or are we going to stay within the FY twenty three FY twenty four world? That's a question. I, I have my opinion about that, but I want to hear other people's opinion about that before I say what mine is. Um, Matt, and then I go to Jennifer. Well, so I'll I'll venture a I'll, I'll venture a daring. Uh, I think that projecting out, maybe in more general terms than Sean shared, would be would be good for that document. But I do think showing that there is a significant amount of thought into the long term. Sustainability is an important part of this. And I was also gonna volunteer, Andy, I don't know if this is allowable, but I would be more than happy to help. I almost volunteered to help, but being so new, I'm not comfortable, but I, I don't know if that's allowable for anybody to help. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have to be very careful because we ran into a problem with the uh, prior time we tried to do this and we found out that if we right. agreed during the meeting to appoint more than one person, that it is a uh, subcommittee. And I have to, I don't want to get into that. Okay. I thought, yeah, I thought so. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Um, Jennifer, did you have some thought? 
Um, I me. just kind of wanted to follow up on the end on, on my end and say that I'm um, similar to what Dorothy Pam had said is that we have an opportunity here to be a leader in our local community or or in the Pioneer Valley in moving forward with this. And I think that Kathy, Shane, and both Lynn both agree you know, stated that the importance of it having a positive attitude. So I do hope that you either reach out to some of the CSWG members if you have time or look at the reports to get some of that, pull some of that information out um, into what you write up to your recommendations, just so that it keeps that tone of positivity. And let's remember that um, we have to prioritize our community at some point, right? Because the way that the government is running and, and working is one is I don't want to say one sided, but it it fits a different way. But there's a there's other communities that all of the rules and policies that are made are that community is affected by it. And there's no understanding of how it affects them, why it affects them. And it's these small initiatives, although they're expensive initiatives um, that make all the difference. And I just really hope that you guys understand the prior that we have to prioritize um, at some point. The, the BIPOC and other marginalized community members that are, reside here in Amherst. Lynn? Yeah, I just, again, to start out with the positive and yet acknowledge that with this and other demands on our budget, we see challenges down the road. I don't want to whitewash it. I just want to make sure that we're clear that this is still a priority. Bernie? Yeah, the the uh, the old human services worker in me um, really sees a value in this. Um, and the old town manager worker in me sees the value in this. And I think we need to, that's important that we, we emphasize that going in. I think Lynn's point, Kathy's point, yeah, Jennifer's point is a great one that, that you know, the, the positive nature of this. We should stress that there are gonna be challenges long-term that we are going to have to be inventive in terms of identifying new revenue sources to sustain this and other things that we find valuable. And I also think we have to make the point that there's additive power in small numbers. So when you sit, sit there and debate and say, well, this is only $50,000. Well, yes, <laughs> it's gonna have to get weighed against far and away more important things. And some of the smaller stuff may have to get set aside uh, for the greater good in the, in, in the larger whole here. Okay, I don't see any other hands up. I mean, I think I, I'm in agreement with everything that has been said. Um, and Sean's gonna have to advise us to whether he thinks that what he showed us can be shared with the larger uh, world and how large a world, but, uh, I think the other uh, thing that I would like to do is to thank, make sure that in the report that we uh, recognize and thank this implementation team for coming up with a plan that at the inception is economically feasible and well thought out and addressing the goals that were set out by the working group in a uh, responsible manner and also recognizing that it's going to take um, additional um, experience in order to um, really find out what level is needed. The this, this start they have given the community in taking um, the working group report and um, crafting a real program should be um, uh, recognized and we should be thank, thank all of you and um, the entire implementation team for its efforts to do that. And uh, the, um, you know, the other thing I guess that I still feel strongly about is uh, that we this may art may have to be made. We don't have to say will have to be made, but uh, there's some insidious to that. But uh, if the as Sean has pointed out, 
if those deficits continue, then, choice, then we either have to be successful in raising the revenue, which we hope is the way we go, or we're going to have to be making some hard choices on expenses. And uh, the more additional expenses that we take on for other causes that have been identified by the council um, are going to add to it. They're not going to subtract from it. So I guess those those are my thoughts about it. Um, Kathy, does this is yeah. Andy, can I just respond real quick? Um, so I agree with being more general. I think it's I don't think we want to get to numbers. I, I have to talk to Paul. We may share something along these lines on Thursday night. I'm not sure yet. Again, I'm still working on um, working on it a little bit more. But um, but I think commenting generally on the sort of long range forecast is fine. So Kathy, are you okay with that? I am okay. I'm I'm writing myself little notes and it will it's one of these that will require a few drafts before I get my sentences to say all of this well. But I'm not trying to write very long, so I can do it. Okay. Cool. And and I just have to, Jennifer and everyone else. It's a totally exciting program. So I'm just, um, it's, it's the awesome reality that we are this small town. And when I first ran for council, I said, I'd be independent on a property tax is about the worst box you can be in. Um, you know, so we, we and, and we are. So uh, just when I look at the other budgets, Sean, you kept them all at two and a half percent. So they just, where you showed us the town can't be at two and a half percent all the way through unless we something, you know, that's that's that gap. Um, and that's what the schools are feeling um, when they when they say, who do we have working here? So I just, I, I can do this and I, it is exciting launching something new like this. Um, it's a statement of our values and that's important. Lynn? Yeah, I just would like to make sure that in the process of the report, we recognize the outstanding work of CSWG, the research they've done, the work that they've done in collaboration with LEAP and getting us to this point. Okay, so um, are we done with this section and just spend a couple minutes on other Finance Committee matters. Is there anybody from the implementation team would like to make final comments? Certainly appreciate your being here. And I really thank you, all of you for your time and invite any of you who have any last comments to feel free. If not, then thank you very much. And I really appreciate your time in this entire process, as well as your time this afternoon. And uh, we will move it along in the process we've described. So thank you. So um, then, uh, Sean, uh, let's see if we can get back to the other things. Uh, as far as the, uh, I see your hand up, Dorothy. So we'll come back to it in a second. Uh, I see you have some uh, Excel spreadsheets there that you've created. Is that you, Sean? Um, that are at what? the bottom, right? Or is that mine? Right. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah, um, it's yours. Yeah, I did, and they're not uh, anything useful for right now. Dorothy, your hand is up. Well, um, where is, I'm looking around the screen, um, Matt Holloway. Okay. I know Matt is a resident member of the committee. Um, I don't know his credentials. It sounded very interesting that he is knowledgeable in this area. And I, I guess I would, um, I understand why he can't co-author this paper. I'm just wondering if he could just add some comments because um, it sounds like you may have something of interest to say. Oh, thanks, Dorothy. <laughs> It's rare that anybody actually 
asks me to provide additional <laughs> comments. It's, so I'm going to bask in this moment for a second. And, and, uh, but I work in special education, and obviously this year is a crisis year for, well, maybe it's not obvious to everybody. I think the, the, this working group certainly reflects an understanding of the current mental health crisis that we're in um, and, and the specific staffing challenges that come up when you're looking for um, for you know on the ground workers who are responding to crisis situations are are really difficult and um, I'm familiar with the temptations of sort of lowering your standards to fill slots um, and that's why I just I feel like it's important and I, I but I, I you know as as members of the working group have said you know the job description will be specific and it will set specific thresholds for mm -hmm. credentials and experience um, and I, I would encourage creativity in terms of you know, if you're going to create a team, you know, maybe these working teams, you know, maybe you set different thresholds for half your members and, and a different, you know, one set are licensed mental health counselors, you know, which is kind of one of the higher level credentials. And another set might be a bachelor degree level, you know, social work credential or, or, or however you wanted to, you know, so you had a team of, of one person with high uh, clinical expertise. Mm -hmm. The other person was just sort of a, uh, or you know, orientation and 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 um, junior members, so to speak. I mean, I think there's a lot of ways to to cut that. I just would, I, I think, just to echo what Kathy said a moment ago. I mean, it is a really exciting time, and and we should be proud of doing this work. And this is the kind of work that, um, you know, and and it extends beyond just sort of that initial incident reporting. I mean, I know that. Um, counseling for individuals who are brought in by the PD, you know, is oftentimes a really important service that can be offered to folks in, in mental health crisis. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think that'll be something that that develops over time with the Crest group, you know, the full range of their functions. Um, but I, I think there is a, there is risk, you know, if we fully mm -hmm. fund 10 slots for FY23, you know, I, I say that the quality over quantity is just like my one walking away note in terms of staffing this, especially because it is a new thing and it's a new service. So, yeah. you know, the need for this service is going to be defined over time. The need is not immediately, uh, the meeting, the need is immediate. I don't mean to say it's not, but, but right. understanding it um, is going to be refined over time. So, but thank you very much, Councillor Payne, for your. Welcome. Thank you. It's interesting. So going on, um, I'm glad that uh, we still have Brianna and Alicia here and uh, Jennifer because, um, and I don't know if Donna Ray has left or not, but we really didn't have any significant discussion about DEI. And uh, I don't know, Sean, if you want to say anything more about that, because uh, that's really more straight a salary. It's not at large. Um, it complex. Yeah. So, um, so the DEI in terms of the, the long term financial picture that was included. So, um, so that part is sort of already addressed. Um, the funding for the two positions, um, one and a half of the positions are already in the the town budget. So it's really just adding half a position that's currently grant funded, which was in that forecast. Um, there were some questions that came in um, related to DEI, if you want me to ask those questions. Some of them I think have already been discussed, but, um, mm -hmm. but I think in terms of a lot of the responses we had for the, um, for the CREST program, a lot of it's similar for DEI in terms of the financial piece of it. Great. I think Donna Wright, um, I guess well, I just want to so open it up for questions. The job description came in, as with the Crest Department, the job description came to the town. We reviewed it. We, we had some back and forth with um, recommendations, questions, concerns, um, and we finalized it at a non-union level seven, which is uh, the salary of 74,895 as the minimum and the maximum at 10652. And again, when I say the maximum, don't forget that that can increase by 2% with cost of livings, there's longevities, but that's the salary range right now for a level seven. And we did um, 
Matt's probably thinking, um, and we did look not only at our internal system and the essential functions and use the municipal rating system, but we also looked externally because there, there were a lot of um, positions that we could look at in the local market to see what, um, you know, mm -hmm. what the rates were. So that's how we that's how we came up with that. And then there's an assistant director position, and we have not finalized the job description on that, so I do not have um, exactly the uh, salary range yet. And then there was, was a question. Oh, sorry. Um, say that again, Andy. Was it was the uh, position for which a job description has not been developed yet included in your budget calculations? Uh, what position is that, Donna Ray? Is that the director position? No, the assist the assistant director, the, the second person. person. Okay. Um, well, the two both positions are in the what was projected. So there's two positions and they were both projected. So Sean um, already took a guess at the salary without my final approval or the town managers. But yeah. no, no, that's that's a good point. I think again, that's another reason why a lot of this is um, you know, a lot of this will be fine-tuned and and sharpened as we go forward when the implementation team and some of these other things are um decided and when we actually get people obviously um the other there was another question sort of related to that which is is the ada coordinator role um or taking over the the accessibility coordinator role is a big responsibility who currently holds this um and are we confident that we can find somebody <clears throat> in the the dei director that can also take on the accessibility coordinator role um so, that, so the, ADA, yeah. Yeah, the ADA has a lot of different titles, a lot of different sections. And so I'm responsible for the one that has to do with employment accommodations. And I handle those right now. And I would be very happy and willing to, I, I plan on being a partner to the director of DEI. So if, if that was a deficit, I wouldn't see it as a, a giant problem because I could help them with that. I, I'm kind of an expert in that. Um, for the kind of accessibility for, you know, municipal buildings and other areas that is um, currently being handled in the planning office. And so I, I'd imagine they would be kind of the same kind of partner. Um, but I, I do agree. I mean, it's a big responsibility. But when you think about diversity, equity and inclusion, you do have to think about um, ability and it's it seemed to be in line with what we're trying to accomplish that's why it's in the job description thank you and, and then there was another question about um so the dei director is being funded um out of the economic development director money um but that position was eliminated if it was eliminated how does the the money still exist um and so just to clarify so the the economic director position it was vacant for several years, but it wasn't eliminated. It was just vacant and the money was still there. Um, and then as part of the FY22 budget process, the decision was made to move that money that was already there to the DEI program. And so it wasn't really eliminating that position, it was reallocating those funding for this new um, purpose. Um, and then I think the last question, um, maybe that's more, related to not DEI. So I guess I'll, I'll I guess if there's any other questions, we're happy to um, discuss them or answer them. I did have one other question, but it may not be a financial one. So it may be a TS when I, when we come on Thursday from my role as a TSO member. But um, I am curious as to why the decision was made to have this position also be directly supervised by the town manager as a opposed to supervised elsewhere, including through Donna Ray, by Donna Ray? Yeah, I think that's um, that's a good question for Paul. I think Paul did, um, he did think through um, whether it be within the town manager's office, whether it be within the human resources office, or whether it be a standalone department. And I think the decision he came to is that he valued it being a standalone department. Um, over those other two options. So, but he would have to weigh in more on um, his rationale. So other questions from the committee, uh, you have, you said you have none left on your list. I think those, I think I've covered, um, I mean, that one, there was a question that was along those same lines about why um, could DEI and human resources um, eventually become sort of one joint office. Um, so I think that question was related, but other than that, I think that's it. So I'll look into the committee then. 
if there are other questions. Uh, Kathy. Um, I'm not sure it's a question. It's, it, well, it is a question, um, but in trying to think through the organizational chart, I'd love to know, and it doesn't need to be answered at all now, um, how do other organizations handle this? Because the small organizations I've been did combine it with HR, um, trying not to fragment. Um, so I understand why one might or one, and, and I don't really want to know org charts. I want to know places where they think the DEI person, officer, has added value in a really meaningful way. It's working well. What did they do? You know, so if there would be some way we could find it, it, and for example, what I'm hearing in some places at UMass, um, it's an extra layer that has not produced what people had hoped for. Um, and so it's a, in an, an administrative cost without a lot of, but not necessarily in all places. So I would just like to know in small, relatively small towns, um, some sense on, and I realize wherever we start, we can shift over time. Um, but just trying to think of how it's, it's, in a way we said with climate change, we wanted it to be a lens of sustainability everywhere. So this is an idea of diversity, equity, and conclusion is everybody's lens, what we're looking at. So how do we best build that in? So I think just a little bit of work on outreach on working well, not working well, um, to get people to give you give us some feedback over the next year or so. So not even on day one. So that's my thinking on it in relatively small organizations, not trying to splinter too much or fragment too much. Comments? Or is there any, any thoughts on that from yeah, I'll, I'll just weigh in real quickly. I'll, I'll give a plug to my school days. Um, the schools have done it multiple ways. Um, the way they've done it recently is they did combine it with human resources. Um, and it, it's worked really well from what I can tell. Um, when they decided to combine it with human resources, it sort of puts it into every personnel decision that's made. Um, so I think that, you know, the, the important thing I think is this is a really good first step. And then as others have said, I think we'll learn and, and evolve as we go forward and maybe it stays a standalone department, maybe other decisions are made, but I think, um, but the schools have done a good job with it. And I'm sure there's places that have done a really good job with it as a standalone department as well. Lynn? Yeah, I, I've gone back and forth as to whether I thought this should be reporting to the town manager or to HR. And a part of my issue with reporting to the town manager is what I said earlier, he's got too many direct reports. Uh, but at the same time, there's also this perception, and I, I wanna just be very clear, it's a very commonly held perception that if you don't report to the top, you don't have influence. And that is absolutely a mistake. There are people Literally, the custodian in the town hall has a lot of influence on certain things that happen in our lives, including getting us out of the town hall when it's 1130 at night and she wants to clean. So I just want to be clear this somehow or another, we need to help people understand that influence is not based on position, it's based on action. Jennifer? Well, I just, I wasn't quite sure if the town manager has the flexibility to change his direct report. I mean, if it was too much for him at any point, wouldn't he be able to designate someone else to report to? Um, and then, um, to Councillor Shane, I, I'm always really, it's UMass is so big. And I think that at UMass, there are DEI directors that work effectively. But, you know, I have a lot of friends who work in administrative positions that like um, director positions, and it seems like they hire layer on top of layer on top of layer anyway. So I, it, it's hard to use that as a comparable. 
to anything. But, yes, I mean, that, I, that's actually something I told the CSWG members not to do. Like, don't compare us to UMass. We're not comparable in those. And, you know, yeah. so I would I would just be careful with that. And then I just there's that part of me, of course, that has to say, like, again, this is about about priorities and I'm not saying that anybody's against it because I don't think that that's the case here I'm just it's just you know my position on it is that um and and working with human resources I think w would work equally too but DEI needs to flow throughout every department right so in theory you know each department could have somebody who was the DEI rep I mean it just really the it needs to be embedded in everything policy procedure who we hire to who we contract all of that needs to, and, and that DEI structure is that important and it needs to be embedded in everything that we do here. Um, and then it needs to spread out to the community to help them feel more included and welcomed here in, in our town spaces. But Matt? So I, I confess to being one of the people who immediately just sort of asked, well, is there any future of merging this into HR kind of thing? Um, but, you know, I don't really believe that. Um, I, kind of, I kind of believe that when I look at the overall charge from the working group and, and from the discussion, just in general, that there is a much broader vision for this office than solely to guide HR and hiring. And, and when I look through the document, you know, I do see that there are a lot of references to sort of, you know, helping to guide strategy, helping to craft policy, reviewing, you know, the charter, things like that, that, that reflect beyond hiring practices. I would encourage, um, Sean, I would encourage you guys to, to come back to this document and insert a couple of concrete examples <clears throat> of the kind, not, not just simply to review, to consider, but but concrete examples of things that this work that this group could do, like Jennifer, we've actually had conversations about some of the you know community ambassadors and some of the not not making a commitment to this is what we're going to do, but a couple for examples because I think the public messaging of of a of a um, department like this it, it it is a little bit abstract you know in the charge as written here, and I think a few concrete examples of the kinds of things we would hope this group does would really make it go down more smoothly and you'd stop having people say, I'll just put it in HR. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think Jen wants to weigh in on that. I think Jen started a lot of this work already, so she may want to, may want to weigh in on that. Yeah, I, I mean, there is also, a uh, oh, Go ahead, Andy. Go ahead. No, I was just say I wanted to hear from you and if Phyllis or Brianna have anything to say, I welcome their comments too. But go ahead, Jennifer. Um, so there is a lot of overlap in what happens with DEI and HR, but there is a separate component in the same way that HR itself is not just limited to recruitment. I mean, the HR department charge itself is so big behind the scenes with union contracts and negotiations and FMLA. And so the same thing happens for DEI. I also want to just throw in there that a you know a good DEI director or or a good DEI department is can work as your economic development director in the same manner, which is something that I've been meaning to say for a while, because I know that that's been, um, you know, at some point it seemed like the two positions were a little bit competitive within each other. And so, it, you know, some a, a good DEI department will have that knowledge that that different BIPOC or other marginalized business owners need to come into the town and helping them get, you um, you know, licensed and working with the different businesses. So I just wanted to add that piece on there too. I don't know, Alicia, Brianna, do you have anything to yeah. add? Do neither of them, uh, Don Ray? I just wanted to say that Paul definitely thought through this a lot. And I think um, I definitely will be a partner with the the DEI director because they're going to want to look at our employment practices, our recruitment practices. They um, hopefully will be an expert in identifying bias where we haven't, you know, figured that out yet. And so we are definitely going to be a partner. But Paul definitely envisions that they're going to be reaching to, out to every service we offer our citizens. And you know, are we is are we offering recreation services in 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 the best way. And so I think that's, so I think 
it would have been probably easier for him to have DEI report to me, certainly. And I think that, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that he won't change that eventually, but I think that there's just a lot of work to be done initially. And I think that's probably why he made this decision, but maybe he, you know, he could probably answer better for you, but I did, I didn't want to say nothing, double negative, but thank you. <laughs> Bernie? Yeah, I, I just want to uh, sort of second what Jennifer has been saying about the kind of overall outreach and the need to have this position be um, flexible and be available throughout. And I particularly appreciate her point about bringing in um, new businesses because uh, that's an area that I've seen fail repeatedly. And so having someone who can do that outreach and, and, and help um, attract people, attract new businesses in, um, is, is particularly valuable. That said, I'm gonna ask a very prosaic question. Uh, is there a need to make up the halftime position that the town administrator's office is losing? Um, Bernard, do you mean the clerical position or the administrative yeah. position that it's losing? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I understand what Paul's doing here. I mean, he's moved stuff around and moved positions around and it's, that's okay, but uh, again, the concern is, um, you know, he's he's got another direct report. It's an important position. And on top of that, there's 30, uh, 20, 25 hours of uh, staff time that's leaving his office. So Paul will have to weigh in on that. I think, again, he feels comfortable at this point making that decision. Um, and I think he's been considering other structures for how to absorb that loss. Um, I know as a town, we're working with Brianna Sunrid and our communications manager to really think about how communication flows in and out of the town to do it the best, uh, the best way we can. Um, but yeah, Paul will have to ultimately weigh in on um, his vision for how that'll be handled. Jen? I, I just wanna say too, is the, that's, you know, from sitting in this, there's also, there's things you know, when we changed government that kind of came over to the town manager's office, there was a lot of shifting in, in the administrative tasks or administrative driven tasks that occurred. And so some of those can, things could be moved. Like the town manager's office is responsible for the reservations of Kendrick Park, DPW's responsible for the reservations on the common, LSSC, or sorry, Amherst Rec is responsible for the reservations at the parks right and so it could be that someone else takes on all of those i mean there's just there's certain tasks that can be spread out to help this move further and not to sp spread myself so thin but i'm always here i'll be on this floor too to help um in the interim right like i won't be able to do it forever but i you know i would never leave my co-workers in my in my floor you know struggling so um, to draw a conclusion, so we can, because it is getting late, um, is there agreement that this just gets uh, combined with the other report that's being provided for Thursday and sort of just the financials are the same because it was all written as a piece. Um, so we don't we have to rediscuss that. And the question of, um, enthusiastically saying that this was a recommendation of CSWG and that uh, it's um, a, a, an exciting addition to the staff and uh, move forward. So I think where we're at, and I don't think we need to really talk too much more about it. And uh, I have a couple of, we have two things left on the agenda and I think I can, uh, dispose of them with the suggestion fairly quickly. Jennifer, your hand is still up, so I don't know if you had anything else to say. Okay. Um, the one, one additional item on the agenda that we were, uh, was the transition plan. And uh, the, I had asked that everybody think about a um, sort of a uh, question of what are the issues that we want to alert the finance committee beyond the just regular annual cycle? And I had thrown out one very specific one, which I guess that Paul's gonna be reporting back to the council on um, soon anyway, which was uh, the one that Kathy and Bernie had been working on about 
uh, water rate structure. And, uh, but what would be, um, what I could do is if people just emailed any ideas that they had that they would like to throw into that work plan, and we can see if that'll work, or if people have something that they'd like to say really quickly now, you know, please do so. But seeing that be raised, uh, Lynn and Bob. Lynn? The only thing I get, just because I just don't see us getting to the uh, fiscal policy manual is that perhaps that's a way to help introduce the new council and the new finance committee so that we just do that as a transition. And other than that, I really think we do them the best service by saying, you know, here are the main fiscal events of the year and how they feed into each other. Boom. Calendar. Bob? Yeah, I was going to, I, I would agree with that. I was going to sort of, as part of that, uh, I think it's important to let, especially the new council members understand all the different organizations that are involved in putting together the budgets. I mean, because you've got the schools, you've got the regional budget, you've got the town, you've got the library, and they all, all affect, you know, the, the, the town budget writ large, but all have different pieces and um, you know the, the the finance committee has more input into the town than to some of these other uh, other budgets so uh, I think that's important for the the, the, the the new council members to know okay uh, Dorothy um, one area that I found very interesting when we first came on was um, the infrastructure that the public doesn't think about. Um, uh, the, the water systems, the sewage, um, all of those basic systems that are necessary for a civilized town. Um, so I think that should be included in some of the orientation. Okay. Uh, of course, we're trying to make sure that we're getting a work plan. I think the questions of parking and the financial side of parking is definitely one that I would uh, include along with that. Um, and uh, Kathy? Yeah, and Sean, Sean will know where, where his opus is, but we started, I sent a memo in in May on different kinds of fees, trying to rethink some of the parking permits. And I know you had an internal group and you said it was near ready, but then we got bogged down. So it might, he, he, Sean will be the best to know, but it might be good to put, put it on the list of something we're going to be able to take a look at. Yeah, just generally. For, yeah, we're, yeah, we're ready ahead. to move on parking. I think um, we're waiting probably till the next council takes over to, to start those more in-depth discussions. But in terms of being ready to go, I think we're ready to go. Um, and Andy, the other thing that maybe just to put on the radar of something the committee should be thinking about is, um, the cannabis impact fees and how those are allocated. Um, I'm hoping we can allocate those in some form or fashion in the FY23 budget because right now they're just accumulating. Um, and so I think, again, that's probably another January topic or January, February topic, but something that the next finance committee may want to weigh in on. Okay, and another one that I had was uh, Looking at the rental registration programs, uh, I think it was mentioned last night, maybe even by Dorothy, um, the uh, fees and what the expectations are from that. Uh, Lynn and Jennifer. Jennifer's had her hand up for a while. She should go ahead. Um, it has been a pleasure. Okay, and Jennifer. I would love to stay, but I'm just curious to know, do you have more questions in regards to the finance for CSWG or DEI? And if you're all right with, okay. Thank Bye, you. Jen. Thanks, Jen. I don't think so. I think we're, I think we're done. We're this last piece and I think we're uh, then ready to adjourn. Okay. Thank, Thank you, everybody. I'll, I'll head out to the oh, thing. Really yes. Thank you, John. Bye. So, um, Thank you, I, do Ray. Think, I do think it would be useful for uh, 
to mention the um, need to review and if needed, update the financial model and also understand the whole nuances around doing a prop two and a half override, since that's probably one of the big financial decisions this council will have to make, this next council. Are you thinking of the uh, question cool. of the debt exclusion for the school or other override? No, debt exclusion for the school. And, and it's good timing because Kathy and I, we have new information on timing of the school. So we'll be able to be more, um, right. yeah, better information on that. Okay, anything else? And as I say, if you send me an email um, in the next few days, because I'm going to work on the uh, guidelines first. And so this will be uh, my second item to work on while Kathy's working on today's discussion. So if there's anything else, otherwise, I think that the uh, point that I was going to come to at the end is we don't really have the wavelength uh, or energy any longer to talk about the um, financial policy manual. Um, is that okay, Sean? That's okay. Yeah. I got it. If anybody has comments or questions on it, it gives you more time to send those in. So no, I'm going to need to leave. I have to go pick up someone at a bus stop. So. Yeah, and if not, we'll move the carry over. So I think we actually we're ready to adjourn, and Kathy is uh, getting us there. So uh, <laughs> anything else that people that anyone wants to bring up from the committee is unanticipated um, business. Andy, do we have another meeting scheduled or not? Um, we do not at this point, and. Uh, I will send out when I do a draft of the guideline revision uh, to give you a chance to comment on it, but I don't anticipate a meeting because um, we could schedule one, but I'm not really anxious to ask everybody to meet again. No, that's fine. I mean, it can wait till after the, the, the new year, but I mean, uh, we we don't know I don't know what the committee is going to look like <laughs> and so, who's yeah, going to call it. <laughs> well, can I can I answer that question, Andy? Yes, sure. So on the third, the new council seated. Uh, once the new council seated, they elect. They're sworn in. They elect a president, vice president. Uh, the president immediately moves to ask who wants to be on which committees and makes those appointments. Those do not have to be approved by the council. And since right now, the way the calendar stands, there will be a large gap between um, January 3rd and January 24th, which will be the next official meeting of the full council. Uh, most of that time will be spent on convening the each of the committees. And the first thing that they do is elect their chair and vice chair. And you will be on the finance committee automatically. You're the only known people. <laughs> I suspect you might see some of the same faces back again, however. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, one hopes. So is there anything else? Otherwise, uh, I want to thank everybody for really a very good meeting. And uh, I uh, look forward to uh, wherever we go in the future. But uh, wish you all uh, happy holidays. and. Uh, I will try and get a uh, date proposed and uh, so at least the people coming onto the committee as well as resident members have an idea of a date proposed. I think that it's uh, we're going to get back to meeting twice a month uh, and uh, but the, we can't really commit to a time until we make a determination of who's on the committee, whether um, and what their time availability is and what their desire is after the first meeting, whether we're uh, meeting uh, on still on daytime hours or whether they want to add, whether there's going to be a request from committee to do something different. And um, the other thing that uh, we're going to have to 
to deal with as we move it along is um, as a council question is uh, whether we're going to continue with Zoom meetings or whether we're going back to required in-person meetings. And I think that's being left to the next council to make its own decision on that. Is that correct, Lynn? Yes. Yes. So um, that's kind of where we're at, Matt. So I just want to clarify. So um, we will not meet any further in December. Is that right? I don't anticipate another need for another December meeting, and everybody's been working really hard. Um, so I think that uh, what I will be doing is uh, just sending out guideline revisions, uh, and anybody who wants to take the time to comment, I uh, certainly will appreciate it. But uh, I don't think we need to actually schedule a meeting. Okay. Everything else. Okay. Seeing that, but I guess we can declare ourselves adjourned. Okay. Happy holidays, everyone. Bye. Yeah. Same. Thanks. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.